Hello and welcome. I am Marianne Fezenden from AMTS, and this is the Nutritionist Webinar. This month, we are very pleased to host Rick Grant, president of the William H. Minor Agricultural Research Institute in Chazy, New York. Rick was raised on a dairy farm in northern New York State and received a BS in animal science from Cornell University, a PhD from Purdue University in ruminant nutrition, and held a postdoctoral position in forage research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 1989 to 1990. From 1990 to 2003, Rick was a professor and extension dairy specialist in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. He left there in 2003 to take his present position at Minor, a privately funded educational and research institute focused on dairy cattle, equine, and crop management. Rick's research interests focus on forages, dairy cattle nutrition, and cow behavior. Rick and I have known each other since the first week of our freshman year at Cornell, and I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to travel to Minor to help him record the webinar. It was great fun, and I came away with a huge appreciation of the task I've asked of my speakers this year. Despite coaching from Tom and practice before the actual recording, all did not happen as planned. Even with a dead cat windscreen, and that is what they call it, we had issues. Rick kindly re-recorded the worst parts. I do have thoughts on this format going forward. Also, my special skill is not necessarily as a cameraman, which you will find out. Even with these issues, we think you will find this a very useful tour. Remember to save your questions for the end, writing them in the Q&A or chat windows. In this recording of the webinar, just know this is a pretty long webinar. We had lots of questions. People were very engaged, so it's a pretty long webinar. It comes in right around three hours. So if you have time to go listen to it at one go, feel free. If you don't, just break it into pieces and enjoy. Well, welcome to Minor Institute. Um, picking up Mary Ann, who you all know and love. She spent, she was kind enough to drive up here five hours to help film the, uh, the webinar today because I'm a Luddite and don't know anything about technology. But fortunately she came up, so she's just coming out of our Victorian era guest house, which hopefully she enjoyed. You ready, Marianne? I am. Let's in it. Straight ahead is a great, this is a great elevation to look at the entire Institute's farm. So straight ahead of us, you can see these older buildings are all from the early 1900s that William Miner himself had built. The, the main barn, which is so neat, it's my favorite barn, was the dairy barn at the turn of the century, the last century, but now it's our main barn for our Morgan horse herd. We have about 30 Morgan horses or so, then an assortment of other buildings. And then just off to the right where we're heading, you'll see the dairy farm. And we'll see a lot more of that in just a moment. So let's keep moving. Welcome to the Minor Institute Dairy Farm. This is where we're going to spend the majority of today's program. Um, my objectives at least are twofold. I'm not sure what objectives Mary Ann may have, but I want to give you a targeted tour of our two main cattle barns. And more importantly, while we're doing that, focus on what I think are the key management and facility factors, which are going to influence how the cow responds to the diet and the feed bulk. Because all of the people listening are nutritionists, and I think we all know how to formulate diets, but how the environment affects the response to the feed is, is my, my topic for today. And before we get going, I chose this spot because above my shoulder over here, you can see the sign. This whole dairy complex is called the Charles Sniffen Dairy Research Center. And that's to honor Charlie Sniffen, who was my predecessor here. I was present for 10 years. And it, it, I'm sure Charlie's in the audience, but if he's not, all you guys know Charlie Sniffen and what he's done for food nutrition for the industry, to say nothing what he's done for Minor Institute. So everything you see today, all the programs, we he definitely laid a good foundation. I want to give him a shout out today. So here's a, we're going to be at the at Heart's Delight Dairy, at the Charlie Smith and Dairy Research Center, Minor Institute. Let's get started. So here we are in our first, uh, first of two main lactation and dry cow barns, mature cow barns. And while I guess Mary Ann's kind of panning and getting, giving you a sense of what the barn looks like, I'll just take a minute and do some quick herd demographics. This is our latest DHI 202 form from uh, last week. So it's, it's fresh, hot off the press, so to speak. As I said, we have about 500 cows um, and about 1,200 acres, so everything's in pretty good balance there. Um, when we tested last week, 
Uh, we had average days in milk was 172. They tested at 97 pounds, so pretty good. Down a few pounds, but not so bad. And their components were about 4.2% fat and 3.1 protein. And that's pretty much, our herd's pretty steady throughout the year in terms of about 4 to 4.2 and anywhere between 3 and 3.2 protein. Okay. Is your milk going to fluids or? It goes to uh, Chattagay, which is an Agrimark cheddar cheese plant mostly. That's where it goes. So, so Cabot cheddar. Cabot. Well, yeah, Cabot and what's it called in New York? Uh, getting off. Oh, uh, McAdam? McAdam, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so cheddar cheese. Excellent. And so, and from our standpoint, I don't want to get into the, to the details right now, but in terms of performance, we really focus a lot on pounds of fat and protein, and we like to see our herd with the genetics and so forth somewhere around 7 to 7.5 pounds fat and protein a day. And right now, I think I did the math, it's about 7.1 or 2. So not as high as we've been, but still pretty good. Um, and then somatic cell counts, the last, they've been averaging about 126, 147, right in there. That's the last two months. MUNs are 9, 11, 9, 9.6. So that bounces around, but not much. And, and mm -hmm. I think it tells us our protein and carbohydrates are in pretty good balance there. A um, couple other quick things in terms of repro, our preg rate. Right now, the average is 20, uh, 28%. So again, and that's increased a lot over the last decade, particularly after we got the SCR system. I mean, we have great uh, staff here, but also the SCR, the rumination activity system, really brought our herd from always, this is 10 years ago, always being around 19 or 20% up into the high 20s, and they continue to inch up every year. So I think that's a, just to get people oriented, uh, having interval 12.7. Overall, it's a pretty productive herd. The rolling herd average, I guess, I didn't say that, that's the one that everyone starts with. Uh, 31,341, so pretty good. Um, but it's a great herd to do research on and to do teaching in, so really happy to be able to show you around today. Um, I guess since it's quiet right now, it, unfortunately it's kind of a noisy day here with, with some construction going on behind us, but as you look at this barn, this end was built just last year, so it looks still pretty clean. The north end was built in 2009, but they're very similar. We basic, basically built this to be just an extension. As you look at it, it, it's really a lot of it's designed as you would any commercial farm. It's got the fans, although today we sure don't need it. Um, you know, it's got the, you know, the um, feed platforms, the headlocks. Uh, we do have an insulated ceiling, which I don't think is very common with chimneys. And in fact, when we first started building this complex in 2004, the ag engineer said we were pretty foolish for doing this. And, some really cold days in winter, maybe that's true, but most of the time it's really nice. We get good air circulation. Um, it's a little bit warmer in the winter. It, it rarely freezes in here, which is nice for man and beast. Um, and we do a lot of research year round, of course. But also in the summertime, when we get heat stress, the, the insulated ceiling seems to help with that a little bit too. All right. Okay. The only other thing that's really probably different from this barn and a lot of the barns that we uh, would, would typically visit, and we can walk around, there would be the drover's lanes around the, the perimeter of the whole barn. Uh, we can get closer, Marion, if yeah. you need to at some point, but um, that helps actually watch the cows, because we can go back there, and we will, and look at the cows, and you, you don't bother them like you do when you walk the pen. Mm -hmm. You can still do that, but you can get a good look at the, the back side, you can look at the front side, and the cows really don't, uh, don't mind. So you get a good look at, at them in their native habitat, if you will. So that goes all the way around. We did that also for research because all these big pens can be subdivided into three or four pens depending on what part of the barn we're in. And so we can let cows in and out of different research pens without bothering the rest of them. So, yeah. So to give people a little bit of perspective, yesterday it was 90? It was about almost 90 here and about 80% humidity. Yeah. So the fans, if we'd been here 24 hours ago, the fans would have been running. Um, not today, because right now I think it's maybe 55 degrees. Yeah, May and in New York. Exactly, yeah. But the cows love yeah. it. Yeah. You know, the cows love it. So. Do you want to look at the, talk about the feed a little bit now? or? Let's do that while it's quiet. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess what I'd like to do today in both barns, I'll, I'll kind of chat as we go. I'll, we're talking about cow comfort, things that affect cow's response to the diet. So obviously you're going to start with the, with the feeding environment, the feed platform, the feed, the feed system. Then we can move to the pen and the stalls, of course. But let's start with the feed. Um, so I, if you walk into a barn, I don't know what you look at, Marianne, but I guess obviously there's the rash, and you look at it, is it pushed up? You know, are the cows sorting? Are there these, I, I, call, I call them woodpecker holes in the TMR, you know? And it's not so bad right now, but in fact, just a little while ago when Marianne was trying to figure out how to make the camera work, one of our uh, 
people came in and said, do you want us to hold off on pushing up feed, right? Or, or change it around for today. So normally they would be coming by right about now and just tapping it up a little bit. Because we like to see it under ideal circumstances. So the mound is probably right about here where the cow can easily reach it, you know. If it gets pushed back so it's right up against the stem wall, uh, two things, one, it, a lot of the times it spills and you, and you waste feed, but also uh, it's harder for the cow to reach it. Her ideal sort of uh, angles to come straight down right about here. At the moment, we're feeding once a day, which is, you know, not exactly right. Two, I, I, I have a slide that says twice a day is better, but it's cool and it's just working for all the things that are going on on the herd. And, and they do a really religious job of pushing up feed, so cows would never have to reach. So as it gets warmer this summer, you'll yeah. go to two times a day feeding? We do sometimes, yes. Yeah. We, uh, we kind of check mm -hmm. it, honestly. I've always mm -hmm. said, you know, feeding frequency is important, but rarely, I think, in terms of feeding management, I would say it's rarely the uh, weakest link, okay. right? I'd say simple feed availability is the weakest link in a lot of cases. Is the feed pushed up with an easy reach? because you know the, the data is so clear you can lose four to almost nine or ten pounds a day if the feed can't be reached and that doesn't obviously that's really going to impact the formulated ration and the cow's response so um yeah but one thing is look at this cow eating i'll get to this maybe in another pen but the, the particle size is a key part of our feeding management here and you know, we were talking a little bit earlier it's really fine i think by a lot of people's standards and if i can just maybe pull up a, a handful here um, if you spread it out here so you can take a look at it. There's not a lot of long particles. There's here's a little bit of alfalfa, but that's clearly the outlier, right? Most of it, it's a high corn silage, hay crop silage based ration. There's just a little bit of hay in there. And I think they're probably using up some alfalfa is what they're doing. We had some dry alfalfa for a project. But as you look at that, you know, there's not, uh, most of the long particles are what? You say one to two inches probably, huh? And that's perfect in terms of uh, stimulating rumination and having adequate chewing. And most importantly, and maybe we can get some sieving data here in a little bit, some Penn State particle separator, uh, separated feed, but a lot of the particles, when you shake it out, over 50% land right on the second box, the eight millimeter box of the Penn State screens. And that's exactly where I think we want them because um, with a diet like these, these corn silage diets, you know, you've heard the story before, I'm sure, um, the cows are going to spend time standing at the bunk chewing and before they swallow they're going to basically reduce the particle size down to the particle size like these right here that are in that second tier, right? And that, that's basically what we're looking at, particles that are kind of like that. They're going to chew it anyway, so our thought is, you know, maybe have you know, five, you know, three, four, five percent on the top and make sure it's not so long that it's going to be sorted, but have a lot of the TMR particle size right in the middle screen. Right. So that way she can eat, you know, they, they eat her probably four hours a day, plus or minus, and that's perfect. We want cows to eat their feed within three to five hours a day. That's where they have the most normal feeding behavior. So they get it done right around four hours a day, and then they have ample time to do what these girls behind us are doing, where they can just basically lie down, hope in a comfortable stall, and ruminate, right? Because particles that are on the eight millimeter Penn State screen, and of course the four millimeter, which is the physically effective the, the PEF screen, you know, those are all, uh, all need to be ruminated. So they have ample rumination activity. They have, you know, optimal feeding time, and it balances off the, 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 the twin chewing, you know, functions of ruminating and eating. And I've come to believe that's one of the key overlooked components of, of forage quality, is what we do to the cow in terms of her time budget at the bunk versus resting. Yeah. Rick, can you talk a little bit about the balance between push up time spent or multiple times pushing up yeah. and allowing for for the cows to continue to rest? Because every time you push up, right, it's a, a disturbance and potentially they're <clears throat> up. I mean, you want that's them to a, eat. That's a great question. I'm glad that wasn't even on my mind, but that is a great question. And I think it's something where we need to re uh, kind of reassess what our, our norms, what we think are what we think to be true because if you're on a farm, well, I guess ask the audience, if you're on a farm and the skid steer or whatever goes by and it pushes up feed and cows are lying down and they get up and come up and eat, what's that tell you? That tells you that they're hungry, right? And is that a good thing? Because that would tell me that the feed's been pushed back long enough or out of reach that the cows want another meal. 
and that shouldn't be happening. So I think that really feed push-ups are there just to keep feed always in reach and to make sure the cow never goes away from the bunk frustrated. So if, if you're on a farm and feed push-up triggers very many cows getting up from the, the stalls to go eat, there's a problem. I would view that as a red flag. Okay. So that's, that's a great question though. So feed push-ups are critical. <laughs> that's a loud bird. Um, how many times they, but also when. And so I think people need to look at, that's a red winged blackbird. Oh, that's so pretty. Yeah, he's gonna come probably, a little beggar's gonna peck some grain and change our forage to concentrate ratio. Anyway, so I think the best time to, to really focus on, the, the research would say, focusing on push up and feed that one to two hours after feed delivery, whenever that occurs on a farm. Because the cow is here, obviously. They're done with their meal and they're lying down. But if they were all actively eating like this group over here, that's when they're most likely to be pushing back feed. They're reaching, they're pushing, they're doing that sorting. Within hours, certainly within two hours, that's when you want to run the skid steer and push feed up. So maybe that might mean pushing up is uh, six to eight times a day, and I'm fine with it. Take a step back and watch and see what happens with the cows over 24 hours. And are you pushing up at the right times? To come back to your question, you don't want your cows to get up when you push up feed. When you deliver feed, yes. But when you push up feed, that should just be a way of keeping feed in front of the cows. Are um, our robot push-up machines a little less disruptive and perhaps they just keep it within reach? Robots can work really well. Yeah. And I know more and more birds are getting those. Um, people say that they, they work better than a skid steer or some other manual type of thing. The first where they have the biggest payback is where, for whatever reason, management couldn't get it done with a skid steer or some other standard way of doing it. Because it's all about getting it done routinely. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the Brothers of Laley, whatever brand it is, they, they work real well. And some of them actually, um, some of the smaller farms, some of the robotic farms, they have like a little reel up front and they, they push up, but they also re blend it too, which is a great thing to do. Get rid of that problem of them. sorting to subtle it during the process. In this barn, we have entirely headlocks. Um, they, they're just such a great management tool and they're ubiquitous. Almost every dairy farm would have them, certainly in North America. Um, we'll see in this barn, if you look at it, you don't know this, but from pillar to pillar is 10 feet in this barn, up and down both sides of the alley. And you can see there's four headlocks. So if you do the math, these are 30 inch headlocks that we have here. In our other barn that we'll, we'll go to in a moment, they're actually 24 inch, which are more industry standard. There's maybe something to think about. Um, we're a little bit different, we're a researcher, so we could afford to put 30 inch headlocks in the whole barn regardless of the, of the stage of lactation or, or the animal group. But I think we need to come back and really reassess what we're doing as an industry. Are we really creating the best feeding environment for the cow? If we walk around and we see 10 of the cow, you know, but you can imagine, you can leave, you know, these far dry cows, there, there's a cow missing, but easily four cows, they, you know, big pregnant cows can sit there and eat. Yeah. But if these are 24 inches, so there are five, there still only be four cows. So we, we fool ourselves in terms of available bunk space, to be sure. Um, so my question for the, for the audience would be, um, should we start going to 30-inch headlocks? A fresh cow, certainly, transition cows, but what about our high pens, you know? That's, that'd be a great discussion point at the Q&A, and I can show some data and some slides later, but I'm convinced that 24-inch headlocks don't serve our cows well, at least the high producing cows, the cows that we want to eat very aggressively. And if you had mixed parity pens, I think it could even be a bigger problem. So, another good point. What else, a couple of just minor things here. Um, not to sell this product, but except for the machinery around, one thing you don't hear in this barn is the constant clang, clang, right. clang of headlocks, which drives me nuts if it doesn't drive the cows mm. nuts. And this Jordan product, again, there's other products out there, I'm sure, but we have these in both barns and they, they've lasted well, but they're rubberized at points of contact. So all the things that normally go clank, clank in the night, don't. And, you know, the rubber eventually wears off and so forth. But even even after that, it's still a much quieter system. Yeah, you d I yeah. didn't notice it until you mentioned it's it. It's quiet, isn't and it? And then once you mention it, it's, that's, creepy. that's what's missing. Creepy quiet. Um, but not really missing. But you know, I, that clang, 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 it, yeah. it's, it's associated with a, with a dairy farm, right? Yes. But I love this 
quietness. And even when the fans are on, their belt drives, which I know have, you have to, they're, they're more of a maintenance hassle, but they're quiet, mm -hmm. quieter than direct drives. So it's overall, it's a very quiet, calm barn. And I think that you don't maybe think about the importance of that enough when we talk about top comfort. It's just calm, consistency, obviously, but just quiet, right? As much as you can. So the only other thing I'd say is these are tilted, which everybody knows is, is, is probably not a bad thing. Um, I'm not, to me, it's not a big deal. And also, I think maybe the angle varies from barn to barn, but the tilt out, um, I don't know exactly how much this is, but if it, I do remember the fact that if they're six inches off center from top to bottom, that extends the cow's functional reach by about 25%. So but what it does is it gives you more latitude in terms of your push-up strategy before the cow really begins to have to reach and probably affect feeding behavior and intake. Okay. So people would choose to put in, what was it, 26 inch, 24 inch, 24 inch headlocks as an economic choice. For sure. But if the cows aren't using them, is it an economic choice? That's the point. To take yourself in that. I see. You did? That is exactly my point. In this farm tour so far, I'm spending a lot of time focusing on the feed and the feed bunk, feed bunk management. So it's, it's clearly a critical component to how successfully you're going to be able to feed a pen of cows or a herd of cows, right? It's a key part of the cow's comfort. And just, just to get your thoughts so kind of boiling for our discussion at the end of this presentation, um, is it time for us to reassess industry norms? And I've been saying this for a little while. And just to make four quick points on Talk about feed push-ups, feeding frequency, feed refusals, bunk space, you know. Um, are our industry standards what the cow really wants? Um, we talked about feed push-ups. Sorry, I showed you some of the things in the barn, right? Um, it's there to ensure feed accessibility. Marianne asked a great question. You know, um, it's especially important during the daytime. It enhances resting time if you have adequate feed push-ups, but it shouldn't be a major trigger for eating, okay? It will reduce sorting and some work by Dennis Armstrong, which the industry is by and large missed, I think. Um, he found an increase in efficiency of milk production of up to 10%. So the intake didn't change when he really focused on feed push-ups, especially on those one to two hours after feed delivery, when he made sure feed was never pushed back. Um, greater feed efficiency. Um, intake didn't change, but milk production went up. And that's a good kind of efficiency to have, isn't it? That re reflects, in my opinion, a true increase in digestive efficiency, all right? And again, I just have this picture here on this slide from a farm from way back when I was in Nebraska, where you can see they clearly need to have that feed pushed up and you can see the sequence. Look, look in the middle of this, this uh, slide, if you haven't seen it before, um, just a few minutes later, look at the bow in that four inch pipe, right? Shouldn't happen if we have good feed push up strategy. And, and I've been also talking about when you push up feed, um, this is maybe fine tuning for sure, but it's kind of neat. And there's research to support it where you push up the feed. And you can see in this slide, um, maybe didn't reproduce quite as well as I would have liked it, but um, the, the major design and the push up ought to accommodate what I call, you know, the natural cow head movement and posture while feeding. And I think I pointed that out in some of the video, but the cow ought to be able to reach down and hit the top of the feed that's, that's been pushed up, and maybe remixed a little bit. All right, but not have to bend her neck way down close to the stem wall. Not only can that cause feed wastage if it pushes it into the, into the feed alley, but it's harder on the cow. So why not just really respect what's natural in terms of her normal movements? We don't think about this at all, but there is data out there. And it's been out there since 2012. <laughs> um, TMR feeding frequency, whole topic onto itself. And I'd love to have some discussion uh, today about that. Um, I mentioned we only feed once a day. Well, that, that's not optimal for sure, but it's working well for us, especially in cooler times of the year. Twice a day is better. And there's several data sets which show that. Uh, Trevor DeVries has led the charge there. We have some of our own data in terms of what relates to de novo milk fatty acids and 2X is definitely better than one time a day feeding of TMR. Um, you get better rumen function, greater rumination, better eating time. But I will just caution you, if you have a system or a situation where you can feed more than two or maybe three times a day, um, make sure you're not impinging on resting time because that will often cause a net reduction 
in, in lactation performance. So keep that in mind. All right. And finally, just I've been I've been hammering on bunk space. And I, you know, it, during the walkthrough in our two barns, one barn has 30 inch headlocks, another one has 24 inch. We talk about you know available bunk space as a function of overcrowding of the stalls. Um, I, I love this one trial. I'll leave you with this before we jump back into the tour. Um, subordinate cows, that's all we have in this data set. Subordinate cows were given a choice. They could either choose a high palatability uh, pellet, basically a high palatability feed or a lower palatability feed, okay? The high palatability feed, if they chose that, it came with a dominant cow, <laughs> which was either, as you can see from this table, either 12, 18, 24, or 30 inches away. What a devil's choice to put in front of that, that subordinate animal, right? She can either pick the lower palatability feed, which on a farm I think would be sorted out, picked over, maybe pushed back, um, re-fermented, whatever it might be. It's clearly not that part of the bunk isn't dominated by the, by the cows, by the more dominant cows. It's not populated by them. So she would choose that. She chooses not to compete. Well, what would they tell us? With really restrictive bunk space, 12 inches, 18 inches, you can see clearly most of the subordinate cows chose the lower quality feed, the lower palatability feed rather. They fed alone, all right? So let's think about that. That's 18 inches, 12 inches, eight. That, that, those are a lot of six row barn situations. Now, what about 24 or 30 inch? Coming back to this 24 or 30 inch headlock uh, discussion I'd like to have today. Now there's no difference, you know? Um, some cows, some of the sporting cows chose to compete. You can see that and get the high palatability feed. Some with different uh, runs at the, at the Y maze, they, they chose either one, but still at the end of the day, about 40% of them chose the low palatability feed alone, all right? And that's definitely food for thought when you think about, it. you know, even with 30 inch headlocks, some animals will still choose a place where they don't have to compete, all right? So what does that mean? Well, to me, the, a big question, I, I really love to have this discussion, you know, is 24 inches enough? You know, we know the cows can't feed all together with 24 inches. We know it can change the distribution of intake throughout the day, particularly for the subordinate cows. Um, data, which has looked at 24 versus 30 versus 36 inches. Um, you see less displacements, you see better feeding time. To me, if you ask the cow, and that's really what well-designed research does, well, the answer is no. At least in a lot of cases for our subordinate cows in mixed pens, right? Uh, our, our competitive pens, overcrowded pens especially, um, the answer is no. And so we'll go back to the tour now, but be thinking about that. You know, what, what are we asking of our cows? Is it, and is it impossible maybe as we put together our feed bunk management strategies on the farm? So some of that data, would that have been developed on smaller cows? Um, just as the whole scheme has evolved, it's become larger or are you, or, or is this herd sort of our cows are probably larger than our mm herds, -hmm. I would say. You know, 1750s and average is a common body weight present in trials, between 1800 pounds, some cows. So they're big. They need big, big falls. And it's certainly that that plays into a major space as well. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I need to point out is some people are looking at this, they're probably saying, well, where are they? Look at this, not a lot of cows. And in fact, I hate to say it, but I'm just going to say in case someone plays this in slow motion and counts. <laughs> it's overcrowded. And I should be taken out back and flogged because I run my mouth all the time at overcrowding. But for different reasons, research locks down some pens and are trying to expand all the usual litany of excuses. This pen is overcrowded. I forget the exact percent. It's like 125 or something, which is right about to the point where I think an excellent manager really run has, has problem 120 or so. But we do have, it's not as bad for these cows because of the research. We talk about difference between a commercial dairy and a research farm. We have this one big pen which holds, I think there's 72 stalls in here. Pretty short from that end, head to head, sand bedded three stalls. But it also can be subdivided into one, two, three pens for research. Right now it's open because we're not doing a trial. And so we have extra wide crossovers up right here in front of us. Nobody in the right mind would have two water tanks and double the, the crossover, right? Cows can lounge there. It, it, it's, it's valuable space. But we do it for research. 
But because of that, you know, there's headlocks the whole length of the way. So there's something like 96 headlocks for 72 stalls. So, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm uh, rationalizing a little bit. So the overcrowding doesn't bother me as much as it would in the real world. How's that? Plus, I know feed's always there. Yeah. We've got almost four inches of water space per cow. So we've got ample access to resources. In this pen, they're deep bedded sand. Uh, so we're trying to make it as comfortable for the cow as we can. All that being said, though, if we were running closer to 100 110 percent of stalls, that would be better. But now I see you have a brush down here. I can just see it in the distance. Yeah, we're we're slowly moving brushes, and this is a pretty new barn. And COVID got in the way of, of some things being delivered, and brushes are one of them. And now our maintenance staff is a little bit behind. But eventually, we want brushes in all of the quadrants, right, for mm -hmm. cows. And even probably if we start breaking this up for research, we want them at each. You know each potential pen. Um, Rick, I'm wondering or concerned that that might be providing a little bit too much noise. Too much background noise. Don't we're not going to make them stop. That's oh. that's a data range, right? So they're feeding cows. Yeah. The so they're feeding. Um, some there's some they're, they're training some cows to use calendars. Okay. I should probably. We should them. talk about that. So. Yeah. So one of the one of the interesting things about this farm, since it's a research farm, is that of course we have research cows and we, we feed with uh, Callan data rangers which are small scale mixers. We have about uh, three or four of those. And then the bins, each cow has her own feeding bin, although she's in a group housing situation and she has a transponder where she can have access to only one, one ration. So it's a very common research tool. Uh, we'll let this guy do his thing then we'll continue continue with the tour, but we'll, we'll probably go offline for a minute, but one thing I can say is, if you can hear me here, just to, so we can back up, if you look at the headlocks, all of these, these are 10 foot, 10 feet on center, on purpose, if you look over here, these all have pins, top and bottom, top and bottom, throughout the whole barn, so when there's no trial going on, we have the headlocks, but if we're putting in data, so we're using the Callan bins, we have about 180 of those, so we can almost fill up the barn with talon bins for different trials. We just bring up a skid steer with, with forks. These can be lifted out, and then a section of uh, talon bins can go in its place. So again, we try to be flexible here. And today, you know, like I said, this is a high pen. Car drive is kind of fresh right here. Okay. Then we'll walk down and we have a close-up, bedded pack, maternity, and then a medium produ production pen down there. But every month, cows change here for research. And our poor farm manager, Steve, who you met a little bit ago, yeah. um, he does a brilliant job because people talk about, what's your grouping strategy on the farm? Is From his perspective, it's like, whatever it takes to keep cows moving around with regard to research. And so, right now, this is the far dry. You know, if he came back this fall, there might be even another bar. Could be just depending on what we need, either we want to have a dance, transition cow studies, or any kind of lactation. Well, this yeah, this is a good open shot of the of the beds that we have here. In this barn, we all have it's all deep bedded sand. They're, I believe I should have measured these, but I believe they're 50 inch. They're, maybe maybe they're 48 inch uh, on center. Uh, that the rails. We have poly tubes for the brisket locator. And we try to keep them as open as we can in the front. And actually, on every part of the barn, you'll find a little slightly different layout that we play with different uh, loops and dividers over time. But the sand works really well. The cows, this kick this cow as an example. She's pretty clean. Um, and I'll point this out because, in general, the cows are clean with the sand. They have nice hops um, and so forth. But we see our other barn that we'll go to with the mattress system. They're going to be a little dirtier and you get some more roughed up hops. Sounds like having two farms. Two farms in one. So. Great. Right. So here on this side, we're now on the north end of the same barn. On this side, we have our close-up uh, bedded pack. And actually, a lot of these cows are getting ready to enter into a research trial of Heather Gans, a transition cow study. Uh, it, it works out well for us. And again, we can have any number of pens for research, or we can open them up for uh, just normal herd management. But we have the, the deep bedded sawdust over here, and it works well. And of course, we have the headlocks and the feed system. We also have the cow and bins down here. These cows are going to go on to a study. After they calf, so they need to be trained to use the cow and bins. And 
that way it doesn't affect intake right off the bat when they're starting their study. Then over here behind us is one of our mid-lactation, so our medium production pens. These cows are probably in the low hundreds, I suppose, right around 100 in terms of milk production. But you can see it's a very similar diet, a little different nutrient specs, but in terms of the makeup, the physical form, it's pretty much what we saw at the other end of the barn with the high pen that we started out with a few minutes ago. Um, this is getting ready to be pushed up. You can see there's a fair amount of active eating that's occurred in some of the, the holes where they would, they're, they can't eat without trying to sort. That's what cows do, but this is a very non-sortable diet. You can check it again in 12 or 24 hours and it's not much different than what was originally uh, augured out first thing this morning. So. This is a good shot of our cows. This is what kind of like to see, isn't it? Yeah. They're all actively eating. Um, they're kind of happy. It'd be great if it could be pushed up a little bit. That'll be happening soon, I expect. And you can see with these larger headlocks, easily four mature cows can, uh, can fit in there, right? With little, little necessary aggression on like the 24 inch headlocks. So that, that works out really well. I think now we'll go out to the farm and we'll make right. Go into our original barn where we keep, we still have high, medium, and low producers. We have our first half pepper over there as well. Peppers and peppers. What I'd like to do just for a moment with this uh, handout, and since the, the sound quality gave us a little bit of, of uh, challenges while we made this video, is you just looked at that pen of cows. I want to just focus on three or four key indices for estimating cow comfort and well being. Um, I apologize for doing it this way, but I think it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, all of us use the cow comfort index, as I have highlighted here. And it's simply that, uh, that old measurement of looking at the proportion of cows, as it says right here, that are in contact with the stall, they're actually lying down. All of us have used that for many years, um, but I'm here to tell you it has nothing to do with 24 hour resting time or lying time. It does estimate the motivation a cow has to enter a free stall and lie down. So in that regard, it's important. Let me just scroll down here. And this is some data, I believe from Edo et al, which shows cow comfort index measures I just explained. So it's the percent of cows uh, that are touching a stall that are lying down versus measured 24 hour lying time. And you can see there is zero relationship. So don't kid yourself if you're measuring, that's a simple thing to do. And many of us, when we're walking a herd for the first time, automatically start counting the number of animals that are, that are lying down. It's, it's important, but it's just an indicator of motivation. It has nothing to do with 24-hour resting activity. Another one, the inverse of that, which is less commonly used, but, but very useful, is a stall standing index, which came out of Wisconsin a few years later. And it's the proportion of cows that are in contact with a stall that are standing. So it's the inverse. Um, now the interesting thing is shown in this figure right down here with stall standing index is unlike uh, CCI, cow comfort index, the stall standing index is associated with increased daily standing time, which is important to our cattle relative to lameness and general hoof health. As you can see here, um, when you have a stall standing index, it's 0.2 or thereabouts or greater. So 20% or more of the cows, you can read across that means on average, you have animals spending two hours a day standing in the stall. And the research would say that's too much. That is associated with, with unacceptable high risks for lameness. So the stall standing index is useful for monitoring and relating to how much total time is a cow likely to be standing in the stall, which is not always a good thing. But the point I'd like to get to today, relative to overcrowded pens, and this certainly the pen you were looking at is an overcrowded pen, uh, could be worse, but in general, the stall use index, I think is our best overall measure of cow comfort for overcrowded pens, which are so commonplace, at least in the United States and other countries around the world. And it's, you have to think about this, but it's a proportion of cows that aren't actively feeding at the bunk. Okay, so it's a proportion of cows within a pen that are lying down minus those cows that are eating at the bunk. And some people have said, well, maybe you should also throw in cows that are actively drinking. Well, great. If you can monitor that, add that in. But certainly the cows that are feeding. So it's a measure of the fraction of cows that are lying down divided by the cows that really aren't wasting their time, right? They're not just idling in the alley. 
And this is neat because work by Pete, Pete Prozell a few years ago showed that this most accurately reflects cow comfort within an overcrowded pen, especially as you approach 130% stocking density of stalls and greater, okay? And it really hones in on that fraction of cows that are wasting their time idling in the alleys, right? So they're not eating, they're not lying down. You might even say they're not drinking, all right? When with all of these, we want to measure these comfort indices when the cows are motivated to lie down, right? And, and recommend, recommendations commonly would, would say, well, two hours before, about an hour after milking, when things aren't very active in the pen, then cows are most likely, likely to be lying down and also ruminating if they're going to be. And that leads us to the last metric I'd like to share in this little segment right here, rumination index. Again, this is something we all measure as nutritionists, especially when we're walking pens after a, a, maybe a ration change or some other major change, or if you're walking through a herd for the first time, and it's basically the proportion of cows ruminating that are lying down. And we always said that should be about 50 to 60%, maybe 50% is a good number. But we never knew if that was related to rumination time per day in any meaningful way. Well, Matt Campbell, when, when he was here, actually looked at that, and this is some data from his thesis, his dissertation. You can see that when you have the rumination index about 50%, so about half the animals lying down or ruminating, if you look at that and read across, by golly, you get pretty close to rumination time of about 500 to 520 minutes, which is right about where you'd want a healthy cow to be in terms of daily rumination time. So the bottom line is our old standard of rumination index Keep doing it because it is reliably related to how many minutes a day the cow ruminates. And it's also useful to watch the cows ruminating, even if you have something like an SCR or some other rumination monitoring system, because that will tell you minutes per day, but you also want to know where is the cow ruminating, whether she's lying down or standing. If not, come back to that in a little bit. But the short answer right now is that when cows are in a stall ruminating, it seems to be associated with much greater uh, rumen pH is much less subacute acidosis. So rumination time, but where the rumination occurs seems to be equally as important to the dairy cow. Now let's shift our focus just for a minute on the stalls. The resting area is actually the cow's most important resource followed closely by the feeding area. I want to make three points here. We can look at the design of the stalls and talk about things that are important. We have a deep bedded sand bed. You can see the cows are very comfortable. They're well indexed, they're open to the front. So everything about this set of stalls is pretty much what you'd want to see, I think. But what I want to say is that when you're on a farm, it is important to monitor the cow comfort. And there are three basic cow comfort indices and they all have their usefulness, but they tell us quite different things. Especially as pens are overcrowded, stick with stall use index. Look at standing and always monitor rumination, all right? So typically what time do you, um, of course it's gonna vary by farm, Yeah. but when do you here at Miner choose to come out here and collect those indices? If we were gonna do it, we wouldn't be doing it now, first right. of all. We're actually, it turns out we're like the worst time of day. But usually about an hour or so after cows are back in the pen, one to two hours, they've eaten, they've had a drink and they're lying down. If nothing's going on, that's going to get them up again, right? Or maybe a couple hours right before milking. Again, it's a quiet time in the pen if you're really trying to look at stall use especially. Obviously, if you're trying to look at something to do with feed and aggression at the feed bunk, then it has to be in that first hour after feeding, right? Um, and now one thing I mentioned earlier, we don't do a lot of the indices here because, you know, we, we kind of know what the pens are, but if you're kind of coming onto a farm in troubleshooting mode, you should definitely do it. And we have the SCR system, so we can monitor rumination every day. And so the, the, the snapshot is, is, doesn't make sense for us. But one thing it does is it tells us if the cows are ruminating in the pen, lying down in the free stall, free stall I should say, because uh, an SCR system or any kind of a system that measures rumination, mm -hmm. it gives you minutes per day, which is really tremendously useful. Like I said, it should be around 500 minutes or so a day feed there in the wee hours in the morning when you're not there. Because again, max work, now this is a commercial for Mac, but you know, when feed was pushed back in the wee hours in the morning and they were overcrowded, those cows had horrible rumen pH. They, they were subacutely acidotic for up to nine or 10 hours a day. 
So we need to think about this and what that means to the cow's ability to digest the, the ration, right? That's put in front of the cow. So, so good question. Uh, let's let's play play games right here. Um, Twenty-eight oh one. Radar. Yes. Yeah. What would? Um, so at this point in our tour, Rick and I played a guess the cow weight game, and I asked Rick to guess what this cow weighed. She'd been following us a bit, and she was very friendly. This was to sort of follow up on something that was done a few years ago at the Cornell Nutrition Conference, just emphasizing how poor um, nutritionists and really experienced cow people are at guessing a cow weight and the importance of scale. Our audio was really bad at this point, so I dropped it out. The point is always weigh your cows and know what they are, yeah. right? Not rely on some mover going, I think that's 1,600 pounds. Because we did a yeah. little quick math. So what, a 1750 was 790 kilos? Something like that. Yeah, that was, well, that was too and long ago. And a 650 ago. was 700, or yeah, yeah, 1650 was 750 kilos. So, so there's a, a 40 kilo difference or a 100 pound difference, which yeah. you translated quickly in your be about four difference of about four pounds of dry matter intake potentially yeah. between those two body weights, which would be hugely significant, right? If you're trying right. to formulate a diet for a, for a pen of cows, absolutely. So, yeah. Just weigh your cows. Weigh your cows. Um, channeling Tom, weigh your cows, people. Weigh your cows. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> So now, okay, so I think what we'll do now is we'll walk through to the end of this barn and then we'll go into our second barn. And remember, the big contrast there will be this barn is all deep bedded sand, okay? And our other barn and 30 inch headlocks, and our other barn is from 2004, much older, but it has uh, mattress systems we'll see in a moment and 24 inch headlocks. And it'll look like an older barn, obviously. So when was this barn built? This barn was built in 2020, okay. our COVID barn. And then as we're walking to the north end of it, it was built in 2009. Oh. Well, here we are in the north end of our older, the second of our two main barns for lactating cows. And you can see that we have modified a lot between this barn, which was built in 04, and the other barn. One of the first things you notice is that this barn does not have the drover's alleys, and we sorely miss them in this barn because whenever you split pens for research, you have to do that dance with the gates where you let the cows out at once, close the gate, bring the other half in, and so forth. Working with the milkers, they have to be saintly to allow us to move all these cows around. But again, we do have the, you know, the insulated ceiling. That's worked well. Um, not as many fans. We, we went heavier on the fans because we do get episodic, but still significant heat stress here. But the big thing, if we can look maybe right through here, you can get a good look at it. We have a mattress system. These, I believe, are Anna mattresses with sawdust, a couple inches, as you can see. And the real problem we have with those is with any kind of wind, we struggle to keep the sawdust on the mattresses. What time is it now? About 10 or 10.30? These were freshly bedded this morning, and it's really hard to keep these platforms covered if there's any wind or even if the fans are on. Another thing I should have pointed out in the other barn was that we have grooved concrete floors in the new barn. Here in this barn, this older barn, we have rubber flooring. It's really nice on the cow's hooves. We do have to trim feet more often on this surface. Our guys try to do a pretty good job of keeping their switches trimmed to the best of their ability. So the cows, even, even for a uh, sawdust barn, they're, they're pretty clean. Uh, we do get sawdust on them, which is kind of a barn. We'll get into much discussion of stocking density during the Q&A session, but all of the work we've done here with stocking density, some of Mac's work and others, has been done in this barn. So if, if you ever look at that data where we talk about the effect on first calf heifers or older cows, you wonder what did the barn really look like when they did the research? Well, here it is. All right, now that we've wrapped up the tour and we're getting, getting ready to be done with the webinar today, I just want to have one raise one more point, and that's, you know, Everyone out here obviously is a user of nutrition models. You know, it's an AMTS webinar and they're great and they continue to be improved. But we, as I've said time and again today, and we all know we have to consider feeding management, animal management in their applications. And the goal has always been to incorporate cow management into nutritional models. And I just wanna leave you with this and we can talk more about this afterwards. And I believe Tom talked about this in one of his uh, earlier 
webinars. Um, we've moved closer to being able to do some of this with the model that's been described by Mike Miller as part of his uh, PhD dissertation here last year. And uh, you may have a hard time seeing this, but this is just to get you thinking and, and, and maybe have, have some questions that you might wanna ask. Um, the main components of the model that he put together um, shown over here would be down here in the lower left would be the standard time budgeting that we've been working on forever. Tom and I put this together a decade ago, right? And one of the key points here is, if you can read it, you know, milking time, you know, the number of periods and the duration of milking throughout the day. And then other things that uh, basically would take up time in terms of treatment, drinking, other, other activities, and you have time available for eating and resting here. And then what Mike also did is he pulled together um, a prediction of eating time. And he found that PENDF or NDF, uh, body weight, of course, milk, feeding frequency, all were important in predicting eating time. And so you can, you can subtract that uh, um, prediction from the, the total available time and you get time available for rest. Then over here, we have a, a way to adjust resting time by stocking density. And I'll show that relationship in just a minute, but that's very strong across a number of studies. And then we use a much weaker, but we think still important relationship between resting time here and milk. And then of course, milk can be corrected to fat corrected, and then it flows into the NRC dry matter intake prediction equation. So we see uh, what we hope is, is an initial step to try to put together a tool which is available within AMTS right now to try to um, troubleshoot intake issues on the farm, which might be related to some of the key management factors we've talked about today, like maybe feed frequency, feed availability, all well, that needs to be approved, but stocking density for sure, uh, time outside the pen, time budgeting. There's certainly limitations left, it hasn't been validated. We hope to do that over the next year or so as we can, uh, obtain data sets to do that. There's no adjustment for parity, which we know is critical. You know, the first calf heifer is not the mature cow. As I just said, I kind of misspoke a little bit, but we need to do a lot more with feed availability because we know that's important. I spent a lot of time talking about it. And to this point, we just have feeding frequency sort of implemented in this, in this tool. So um, here's, here's just a graph that Mike had, had pulled together from nine different studies. And you can see stocking density, is highly related to lying time in this across multiple studies. And you can see also here's lying time. This has been updated from the, the graphs you would have seen in the past from us. Lying time versus milk yield. Uh, variability for sure, for sure. But still, nonetheless, about 36% of the variation in milk is explained by lying time across these nine studies. And if you do the calculation, the slope would tell you that if you can do something to improve the comfort of the resting environment, and the animal rests one hour more per day, that's equated to or equivalent to about two, a little over two pounds more milk per hour of resting time in this data set. And, and that, you know, that says nothing about some of the other potential benefits of health and other things. And you'll see a wide range, of course, in, in, in milk response to uh, different resting times. But the relationships are there. We think they're biologically important. So we're trying to work toward getting these implemented in some of our nutritional models. So the last slide I'm gonna leave you with, and then we're gonna close out the tour, is just think about management and feeding nutrition and some perspectives I'll leave you with as food for thought. Um, competitive versus non-competitive environments. A lot of our basic nutrition research is done, guess what? In non-competitive environments. How does that translate to a competitive envir environment that you feed cows in all the time? I mentioned Mac's work, Mac Campbell's looking at stocking density and the interaction of density, stocking density and feed restriction had a bigger impact on rumen pH and PENDF and UNDF 240. I mentioned that. And he, by the way, he manipulated PENDF from about 18 and a half up to 22% and UNDF 240 from about eight to 10. So, I mean, it's, it's within ranges that I think many of you work within all day long as you're formulating diets, all right? I didn't mention this, but Melissa Wolpert's work, um, she found that stocking density, particularly bunk stocking density, explained well over half of the variation among herds in de novo fatty acid synthesis. And that of course is related to, we think, to, um, to fiber digestion in the rumen since you know acetate and butyrate are the building blocks of de novo fatty acids. So there's another thing, another reason to be really concerned with, uh, with stocking density and what it does to 
rumen conditions, and then in this case, milk components. And what an incredible amount of variation in milk components. De novo fatty acids is explained just by stocking density. Holy cow. And then something I also mentioned, I think is in our walkabout, think about time budgeting and the balance we force to count into between time at the bunk eating and time in a stall resting. And does our TMR get the job done in terms of her ability to eat within three to five hours a day and have ample time left for that all important rumination activity. And again, you know, a, a, a literature review that uh, Luis Ferretto and I did a couple of years ago, looking at changes in the dietary uh, fiber NDF digestibility, NDF content, or particle size particularly, people could move eating time by plus or minus an hour a day. So don't neglect that. Think about that little discussion we had at the bunk early on in this tour, in terms of the importance of that, of how much, how much of the TMR is, is trapped on that, or collected on that second sieve in the Penn State particle box. Set the 19 millimeter aside and focus on the eight millimeter, because those are the particles, at least in these, these silage-based diets that we feed, that the cow will ruminate the TMR to anyway before swallowing. And so these are just some factors to think about. Uh, I can't wait for the Q&A coming up here in just a few moments. And so we'll, we'll go back and wrap up the actual live tour and, uh, and can't wait again for the discussion that's hopefully gonna follow. So um, just coming back to reiterate, these are the 24 inch stalls. Good point, yes. So if you look at that again, we've got the 10 feet uh, pillars here. And now we have the five headlocks. And this, this is industry standard, by the way. And again, as I said earlier, I'll share some data with you, but there are big differences in terms of feeding behavior and aggressive interactions. This is how cows use headlocks. And again, we're walking through these barns when cows really aren't actively eating too much. But you can just see here in this section, there's two cows, you know, and obviously then there's, there's, there's room for one more cow, even though there's five headlocks, right? Yeah. Um, or I mean, two more and cows. And there's a skip, yeah. right? Two more cows. But, but, right. We're trying to kid ourselves in terms of 24 inches per cow. I've said that two or three times now, so I want to keep repeating yeah. myself. But it would work for jerseys. Using the, the roller brush up there. Now, if we look, I've got a rest of what's going on here. And this, I mean, we have to just sort of walk to the barn, but clearly there's a cow that's got to And this is, I believe, another high pen. Uh, I'd have to double check, but there, that, that's not a good body condition for sure. She's got some problems, I can tell. But the cows, if, if this were normal, and I, I don't think it is, but if this were a normal thing you'd see when cows should be resting, we have a problem here, don't we? Because cows are perching, cows are standing. I think there's just a lot of activity. I can see they're, they're actually they're working on the, uh, the side curve. That's the problem. Yeah, I can see the truck yeah. on the side in, in the horse. But um, just things you need to look for. Normally, if you walk to this barn at this time of day and, and there's not, nothing going on, the cows would all be in the stall. It's kind of like we see over here. This is what you'd like to see, right? Cow resting, a nice, girl, a nice clean floor. The feed could use to be pushed back just a little bit, but there certainly is, there's easy access. We haven't talked much about water, but again, in both barns we average two to four inches per cow, which is ample. Maybe I'll drop in a slide in this presentation about location of waterers, but to me, that's the, as we kind of wrap up. That, those are the big resources. We've got the stalls, want them to be comfortable. We've got the feed and nothing in the feeding environment should impede the cow's ability to eat when she wants to and how much she wants to. Lots of water. And really to me, in terms of the cow's physical and social environment, if you can tweak out those three or four things, that's when you're going to get the most benefit that you possibly can, right? From the ration just formulated ever so carefully with your AMTS program. <laughs> that's for you, Tom. <laughs> anyway. I always caution my speakers that they don't have to be advertisers. But thanks, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're continuing on. Again, I do like to see cows line up to use the, groom uh, the grooming brush. It's not the most important thing to them, but, it, but it, is, it is valuable for them. You can see the water tank here. Now, one thing, this barn also has slightly narrower alleys. We, got a little, we decided that even for you know, when we have multiple pens and multiple waterers, we could use a little wider alley, so we did put those into the, the newer barn. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we have wide headlocks. We use the 50-50, you know, the Canadian approach to, to uh, stalls, so the wider stalls, higher uh, neck rail seems to work well for our cows. This, by the way, is the heifer pen. 
So as far as I know, this is, this is 100% first calf heifers. The rest of the heifers on the farm would be either a different research pen or whatever they're doing with their life. This is a sick pen, so this is obviously well understocked. <laughs> We'd like to actually see it empty. These are cows that have different issues. This is a good example of how to do it from the feeding side. I love the way this feed has been pushed up from a cow's perspective. This is really what we are looking for. I was talking earlier about having this nice mound so that when the cow brings her head through, it just lines up with that angle. She could eat, feed easily and for a long while for length of a typical meal for sure. That's actually about as good as where we're going to get on our farm. The research would say it should be at least four inches thick, and we just can't do that. But that would be deep bedding, a sawdust, uh, deep, deep bedding sawdust, which is what we would say is pretty much the same. But we have a hard time keeping that in the middle of our stalls. We would be trying to finish up this barn here. Uh, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cows just go first cat pepper pen. Here we have our some of our tail end cows. Just get ready. So there's gonna be some more conditioned cows you might see here. Hopefully not too many. But these cows I looked the other day, their days in milk are pretty far out there and they're gonna be dried off anytime. Anyway. Get a nice view here of the actually the alley straight for nothing I'm trying to but I will say in this part of the world, obviously most people use skid steers or something. Flush doesn't work too well this far north. But it does a great job. Yeah. yeah. And we run them nonstop. Obviously this is what you use to scrape up. Yep. This is a skid steer that we use to complete. Nothing very fancy, but it gets the job done. All right. And again, we try to we, we try to focus on pushing up throughout the day, of course, in relation to milking. But also, we kind of try to keep an eye on when the cows, after they have a meal coming back from the parlor, push it up before they get the feed too far pushed back. Well, there you are. We hope you've enjoyed the tour of the William H. Minor Institute. We tried to look at things to focus on relative to making sure that the ration works for us with regards to feed bunk stalls and looking at cow comfort. We look forward to the discussion after this presentation. If you get a chance and you're ever in Northern New York, please stop by. There's a lot more that we didn't get a chance to see in this video. Thanks, Marianne. I tell you a joke and you tell me if it's funny. Uh, okay. Wait, this is gonna knock you off your feet. Okay, here it goes, ready? Knock, knock. Oh, I always love these. Okay, who is it? Oh, he's right here. So our next nutritionist speaker is Dr. Satiros Karvunstis of Mendip Veterinary Services in Somerset, England. Um, Dr. Karvunstis received a degree in the Veterinary School of Aristotle University of Thessalon Thessalonica, Greece, my tongue can't get out of the way. And, and Soterios gave me pronunciation help, but it doesn't help me when I'm nervous. Um, his first post was a predominantly cattle post based in Holsworthy in Devon. He set up the Mendip Veterinary Services in 2017. His main clinical interests are cattle fertility, genomic benchmarking, reproductive and abdo abdominal surgery, hoof health, mastitis, bull and ram semen testing, pathology, and ruminant nutrition. As if he's not busy enough, he is also a certified um, helicopter pilot. His July 8th discussion will be cow side discussions of nutritional considerations to maintain best cow health. Register to join us for the 9 a.m. or the 6 p.m. webinar by visiting agmodelsystems.com webpage and looking under the Nutritionist 2021 webinar tab for that link. Next week, we are going to be holding a webinar in conjunction with the Canola Council of Canada featuring Dr. Chayuki Benchar, a research scientist at the Sherbrooke 
in Research and Development Center of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. His timely topic will be dietary options to reduce enteric methane emissions from dairy cows. His webinar will be at 9 a.m. More information can also be found on our website. As always, you can email me directly for more information. I'm very thankful for my co-hosts who helped me with these webinars. This morning, we're joined by Elena Bonfante and Bill Prokop of Dairy Innovations Italia and Dairy Innovations, respectively, um, Hudai Kavustaran of Zerv, and, our, um, all, and also our distributor in Turkey, as well as our distributor in China, Sean Lee of Ansi Tech, um, Dr. Marcos Neves Pierre of the University of Lavras in Brazil. Paula Torillo helped me immensely, and she translates these webinars with the hope, help of Paula Alanis into Spanish, and they'll all join me at the six o'clock. I am also thankful, and these webinars would not be possible without our sponsors. We thank our gold sponsor, Arm & Hammer Animal Health and Food, Animal and Food Production, hashtag science hearted, the Canola Council of Canada, learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com, Adina, experts in animal nutrition with expertise in plant bioactives, and Proteca, transforming the future of farm animal health. Our silver sponsors are Aginomoto, Superior Nutrition Through Amino Acids, and Virtus, both of whom have sponsored us from the very start. Also the Forage Analysis Labs of Dairyland Laboratories and Dairy One, both with affiliates around the world. Adiseo, Ruminant Nutrition Solutions to Ensure Animal Performance, and Micronutrients, Feeding the Future, round out our, our silver sponsors. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max, Purdue Agribusiness, Origination Inc., Phileo, Balchem, and the Milk Group. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope that you consider them in your formulation decisions. So with all of those um, said, I am going to welcome our panelists, give them an opportunity to greet each other, and then we'll start working our way through the questions. Um, I will usually, my my um, attempt is to go ahead and do the introduce our panelists and have them make some comments, and then we get into the questions. Feel free and please do put your comments or your questions in the question and answer and the chat window, and I will read them. Um, I have some that I came up with too. So, Bill, you win the prize because I see you are unmuted. <laughs> You can start us off. And Rick, thank you so much. It was really a delight to work with you. Um, you did a good job on the dubbing. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you, Marianne. And I didn't want, once punch you, did I? No, I didn't know that was even a risk I was running. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, thank you for the overdubbing. It's a little bit like maybe a bad foreign film sometimes, but... Uh, Hopefully people got what they needed to out of it. Uh, it was it was great, Rick. It was real. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. So um, kudos. Uh, uh, I'm envious of your research facility. Um, and, and so uh, you guys are doing an outstanding job. And, um, I, you know, it's coming from a different research facility. I, I can really appreciate what you're doing there. Um, the, the thing that I that comes to mind when I see this is again the quote from Peter Sange of uh, MIT fame that today's problems come from yesterday's solutions, and <laughs> we as we muddle through the unintended consequences of our management intervention over the years, it strikes me that as we use a more effective systems thinking approach to understanding dairying, it really gets back, getting back to quantifying what it takes to allow a cow to be a cow. And, Absolutely, yeah. And that is really where we're gonna end up in just emulating everything in her environment and her world that will create the least amount of stress and allow her to be the most productive. Because 
as I reflect back at the Cornell dairy, and the same is true at Minor, these are outstanding herds. They're producing 100 pounds of high quality components. And, and yet, we, are, we were 125% overcrowded at the Cornell facility, um, in many cases. And we did everything wrong. We moved cows and reassigned social groups and changed their diets. And we did, we broke all the rules and yet we got those type of performances and you are as well. And it's testimony to me, the fact that there are certain critical to quality um, factors that we must respect in the cow's world. And as long as we do that, she will, will reward us with high production. And we saw it at the Cornell um, facility and you're seeing it here at Minor. So not to downplay the importance of not breaking rules, but it's very evident that she is very forgiving and very flexible as long as we don't um, violate certain tenants. Is that a fair statement? Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, as, you're, you're, was you, as you were wrapping up your comments there, Bill, I can picture a slide if I'm doing my usual stump speech on management and stocking density, right? Uh, there, there's certainly a lot of data and there's benchmarks and so forth. But at the end of the day, see if you agree with this statement, I don't think the cow really cares what the stocking density is, for instance, of stalls or, or headlocks. We have our targets. But um, I think really what she cares about is, does she have adequate access to her major resources, right? Feed, water, stalls, primarily, when she wants it, in the quantity that she needs it, and in the quality that she needs it, right? And so we, we know about feed quality, we know about water quality. I think quality for resting really gets to, is it undisturbed? Is she at ease? Can she ruminate? And does she have the freedom or the flexibility to engage in all the postures we know cows need when they rest. So absolutely, I agree with what you just said. And our goal is to try to, in all the myriad of management systems and facilities we find ourselves faced with, right? Uh, what does it take? What combination of, of, of management does it take to allow the cow to feel that way? Yeah. So. And I, no, I agree wholeheartedly. And I think as with diets, the question we ask with the model is, so what's first limiting in this ration, okay? And, and we go after that. And, and then all that does is allow us to see what is the next first limiting once we fix that. Um, but I think the same thing is true with facilities and management. And so often we come into these things with a pretense of what's wrong. But until you really step back and evaluate the management system, you can't know what really is first limiting with the facility, okay? The two are, can't be separated. And, yeah. um, and, and that's, you know, that's the, the trick of the tail, so to speak. You know, you, you've got to assess that and then figure out what is, what is reasonable in terms of a solution or what can be done or, or you know, uh, given the situation. So I agree with you completely. Yeah, well, one thing I'll just, uh, that's just, I'll pretend that's a question right, right there, because one thing I do, I didn't make the point in the walkabout, and I meant to, um, Marianne got me off thinking about guessing body weights poorly <laughs> <laughs> when I was supposed to say this, but in terms of, you know, what's first limiting, I can say, and, and I'm thinking about, for instance, the, the management tool that's in AMTS, right? If you've used that, one of the key things right there, the very first thing is time budgeting, and how much time does the cow have in the pen if it's a freestall a barn, right? That yeah. is almost always from the cow's perspective, I think, in terms of her environment, that is first limiting. Because if she doesn't have enough time, access time for whatever it is she's doing, eating, resting, ruminating, whatever, uh, nothing else matters, does it, Bill? I mean, so I'd, I'd say that that's a great point you made, but that from a management standpoint, it's first limiting time, time outside the pen. And I'm going to... Um... Not, again, we, we don't do these webinars to be advertisements nor really pushments, pushing for AMTS, but I am gonna share my screen for um, our attendees who are clients um, so that they can see what you're talking about. So let me just choose the right way to share because it's kinda, hmm, I think this will, I think this will do it for you. I have the cow time management model up. Can you see that? 
Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. So this is what Rick's talking about. The there's the and this is um, directly from the research that was done up at Minor in conjunction with um, uh, Tom Taluki. So <clears throat> and this was was this Mike Miller or Mackenzie? This was Michael Miller. Okay. Well, I believe Mike it's Miller. actually yeah, one of he the would be mad at me. He's here, I think. Um, yes. Anyway. <laughs> So this is this is the um, the how time management model that this is sort of a beta version. We're working on it um, with some. There'll there'll always be some tweaks, but in case you were yeah. curious about what that was, but um, can, I don't know what, what your timing is. But can I just make a couple quick points on this? Yes, please. Um, I'm assuming many people in the audience have access to this, and uh, Mike did a great job with this, pulling together. The data, taking the data that Tom and I pulled together a decade ago and then updating it as of 2020. Um, but there, you can see there's, there's two major factors. And the first one, you enter in all of, on the upper left-hand side there, right? You've got milkings per day, milking time, uh, treatment time, drinking, standing, and other time. If you can get those numbers, and some of them may have to be guesstimates or sort of standard times, which, which we can provide, right? That is what, in this little tool is called, I believe, total management time. That should add up. Um, and then the other, then what Mike decided to do, which was actually a pretty, pretty smart, is saying, well, let's, let's then see how we can predict eating time. Okay, because if you think about it, if you add up all of those components of time budgeting and subtract from 1440 or 24 hours, what you have left is time potentially available for eating and resting. Okay, and that's, uh, is that say 1050? I don't have my glasses. Yeah, sorry. Oh, um, yeah, yes. No, that's okay. So that's the time that the cow has to eat and rest. And so then the other part of this tool is there's, you know, Mike's got a prediction function in there for eating time based on the cow milk production and size, but also the NDF and PE, NDF and the ration. Okay, and then you can see there's a prediction as a hundred and it's like 160 60. minutes. Yeah. So whatever. And that, so you can change that around based on production and so forth. And, and the forage uh, fiber, and other attributes of the diet, um, size of the cow, obviously. Um, so then that's subtracted from the 1050. And then that's, that's the time that's available for rest. Okay. And in this particular pop-up that you have here, that's a huge amount. And, and that's a very, very small eating time, right? Because normally, that, that, that eating time, I think for a lot of our diets, at least here in North America that we feed that are, that are silage based, that would be probably around four hours a day, three and a half to four hours a day, plus or minus, right? Um, but, but if you have that in there and that's reasonably accurate, you can see then that uh, all this basically does is you can adjust also for feeding frequency, but uh, it, it tells you then as you uh, kind of play around with stocking density and so forth, what might be lost in terms of milk production. And it's based primarily on that relationship I talked about between uh, resting time and milk production, which is not very tight. It's only an R square of about 30.36 or so, 36%, but it's a starting place. And at least it's biological reality, I think. So sorry to jump in there, but uh, if people no, no, have that's, that's great. Yeah, anyway, I, I would just say if people are using it, uh, it make, you know, use, use accurate numbers, but time budgeting is the most important part of this. And then if the eating time seems low based on the diet you're actually feeding, I, the way I've used it, I, I've just artificially bumped up some mm -hmm. of the, the time over here on, on the upper left, just okay. to get a more realistic time available for rest. You know, if that's eight or 900 minutes, probably the eating time might be under predicted is my thought. Yeah. I, I didn't do any tweaking with this. This is no, no, and that's fine. That, that, that's going to get used yeah. to people's time right, right now. Um, and this, there were a couple questions or comments, um, and I guess this is more of a comment from Daniel Scothorn, who is our speaker in October, and uh -huh. I think I can, think we can expect something fantastic from him. Um, he just says it's so easy to fix acidosis by tweaking a diet, but really taking time to coach a client through changing stocking density and feeding restriction. Um, though has a really high payoff can take much more time and it's time well spent. So just, no doubt. Just, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I am a miss in, um, I do have some questions, but I would like to um, give Elena and Hudai an opportunity to um, 
give us some thoughts from their their perspective. Elena in Italy, go ahead. Hi, Miriam. Thank you. Hi. Ciao, Rick. Yes. Hello. How are you doing, Elena? I'm fine, thank you. Great presentation, by the way. And uh, I agree with what you said and Bill said about the importance of uh, uh, focusing on these uh, management uh, strategies, even because uh, I, uh, I think in the US as well, but uh, in Italy, uh, most of all in this period, uh, you know, the dairy uh, industry is getting uh, a little bit of critics, uh, I think, from the cons uh, mm -hmm from the customers and the consumers uh, and that they, they ask for you know a better behavior better welfare and uh, a higher uh, quality you know inside the dairy farm and i think that these align very well with what they are asking for but uh, what is most important and uh, what i'm trying to uh, teach also to farmers and to other clients is that uh, that is also the best uh, choice for them as well because it's the most profitable uh, you know investment uh, i think and um, on this um, uh, part uh, i am curious to have your opinion uh, on the um, you know, time budget and uh, dairy cows management. Most of all, uh, uh, in the you know, considering uh, that the talking about the headlocks, for example, uh, that they are seen as uh, you know bad for the welfare, uh, if you would, uh, from the consumers. Uh, and so, do you think uh, that on a cow point of view is the best choice, or would you uh, would you prefer the you know the bank manager? without uh, headlocks. Okay, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would say, I, I think, well, first of all, I guess you're speaking from the European perspective. So if I understood you right, uh, you're saying that uh, the consumer would view headlocks negatively, right? Uh, yes. From a cow yes. welfare perspective? Yes. Yes, well, I, I think actually the, the data would say the opposite. I can see where it might look uh, poor to the to the consumer if they're not used to seeing it it, it looks like the cow's literally sticking her head through like bars in a prison i could see that yeah, right yeah. Uh, but you know what 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 the cow actually experiences what the science says when, when you go back to some of the earlier british columbia work you know from maybe 15 years ago now or so where they compared uh, post and rail versus headlocks in various dimensions and so forth you know what they saw is that actually uh, cows were more likely to be displaced from the feed bunk and experience significant aggression when there were not headlocks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I think from the cow's uh, perspective, well-being perspective, uh, properly sized headlocks would be preferable. Okay. Um, obviously, the more competition you have at the feed bunk, um, the more that the headlocks would, would exert their positive effect, right? Because they really help to define the cow's eating place. And it's, it's harder for a cow to displace another cow from the back versus from the side. And that's basically how that works. But I do think that not, not to ramble too long, but I do think that a key to this question is um, headlocks are good. They're, they're a great management tool. Okay. And one, one thing I didn't say is that if the cows are not naive to them, if they've been trained as heifers, mm -hmm. they have no problem using them, right, for sure. But I think we need to come back and maybe revisit what's the appropriate size. And I, and I probably belabored that. Watching the video just now, I, I mentioned it way too many times, but you know, the industry standard is, is uh, 60 centimeters, 24 inches, but I think it's just more natural and appealing to the cow and the feeding behavior is better when they have 30 inch. And at least in the US, most lenders would laugh at trying to put in 30 inch headlocks mm -hmm. in the whole barn, but why not think about our High producing her, or high, high producing pens rather. Um, I think we would be surprised how much uh, better feeding behavior and uh, response we would see to the diet. Yeah. So one of the Daniel mentioned that the word headlock may be the worst problem we yeah. have. Um, <laughs> it sounds bad, right? A suggestion yeah. of feed yeah. access portal. That sounds um, sounds very sounds sciencey. Like yeah. I see, I see his chat. It sounds like yeah, something, something in a spaceship. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
So, well, I mean, there, there's certainly, that's not my forte is, but, but the public does see things differently than what we see because we see it every day. But I, I do feel pretty confident saying from the cow's perspective, it's a good, it's a good thing um, in terms of trying to manage competition at the feed bunk uh, to a, to a, to a manageable level from the cow's perspective. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yep. And I just uh, one more, if I may, Mariana. Yes. Uh, yes. On the on a time budget uh, point of view, the four X uh, for the fresh cows uh, strategy. What do you think about it? Four. So four times a day. Uh, oh, fresh know. fresh period. You said. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that, that can work fine. I think we all know the biology and some of the production responses that one can see and then the carryover. From the time budgeting standpoint, I, I'm pretty sure that a little bit of data is out there would say that you really, 4X is great, but any, any kind of increased milking frequency, uh, it takes the cows out of the pen one more time or multiple times per day. Still, we have to respect the fact that in most of our management systems, a cow should not be outside a freestall pen for more than about three and a half or maybe four hours a day. Mm -hmm. And that's on average, of course. Um, but, but we know in this, if you do the, the, the simple math for time budgeting, if 4X results in greater than three and a half or four hours a day outside the pen, um, you won't see the response or the response will be muted for sure. And then yeah, the other so part of that is distance, right? Distance that they have to walk. So these 4X pens ought to be close to the parlor, yeah. right? Yeah. So I brought up um, brought up the um, manage, time management model and just flicking back and forth on this, as you said, probably unrealistic in terms of the eating time. Um, but you can just see that it changes, changes 60 minutes. <laughs> That's pretty easy math, given that the milking time per day is 60. So yeah, but, but right there, Marianne. So if you go from three to four, the key thing is how much time is that cow outside the pen? So right now it's one hour a day, which even at four times would be a, would be on the edge of being okay. But if yeah. they're outside yeah. for an hour and a half, uh, you know, 1.5, four times a day, that's a totally different story. I'm not sure what this will predict here, but I just know from what the data would say, that's uh, that's an un tenable situation from the cow's perspective. Look what it does. Look how much it dropped time available for rest. And if we changed eating time to something that was more like three to four hours a day, which okay. would be more typical, you're, you're, you're going to be, um, you're not going to be able to meet that cow's uh, resting requirement. Yeah. I'm not expecting you to change. I know I'm talking. Yeah. I'm trying to find where I can do that. And I don't think I can directly. Input you, that. You, you can't change eating time because that's predicted on the diet. But, but what yeah. I would do, and that maybe someone can do this. And someone could say, this is wrong, Rick. But what I've been doing when I've used this, if I think that the eating time is too little, say I, in this case, let's just say, I think that should be an hour more. I just feel that based mm -hmm. on what I know about the herd. I could take that extra 60 minutes and just bump up something over here, like treatment time, make it 120, even though it's not true, but it does the accounting for the time budgeting. You see what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And now see, now see how it drops. Obviously it drops the resting time. Pretty quickly though, you can get to a point where you have, I think a pretty realistic way to simulate a uh, number of milkings a, a, along with milking time. All right, yeah. All right, right now it's not gonna say much because it's, it's woefully under stock, right? Yeah. But so let's not take the time to try to make Right, right, perfect. right, let's Just not play. There's, there's questions question, but... in people. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So um, Elena, did you have any more questions or, or thoughts? Oh, thank you, Dan. I will leave the time for the rest of questions. Yes. Um, I would be interested to hear some, some of the same sort of thoughts from Hudai or Sean. Um, Hudai, how, how, what are your thoughts from, about this from um, the perspective of, of farming in Turkey? Hi, Marian. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I would like to thank you to Rick about this very great presentation. Thank you. So, you know, I believe in that the uh, management is most, uh, most important part of the dairy farming. You know, if you don't manage the farm well, I think if, you, if even you are doing the best ration, you never get the results. 
So, you know, I, could, I took some notes about your last uh, daily health improvement associations reports. All the figures, all the parameters, are thing, I think, are the dreams of any farmers and the nutritionists. You know, everything is, you know, the perfect. I think there is one parameter in this insight is, uh, it is about the pregnancy rate. You know, I really my, I pay much more attention on this pregnancy rate. If it mm -hmm. is high enough, that means that the other parameters should be better, you know. There is no question is that. You know, I have a question about uh, milk, urea, and nitrogen. <clears throat> so I think it's your figures is about 9%, 9, nine, millimeter, nine, 9 milligram in deciliter, something like that in this reports. Yeah, that's about um, average, sure, for our herd. Yeah. You know, today, exactly this morning, uh, you know, I, we were run, uh, working with our farm, dairy farm here. You know, everything is okay. Uh, you know, we are using AMTS. And we were expecting about 12 moon in the milk. But we, when we checked the milk, it was uh, about six milligrams. So it was uh, unacceptable, you know, low. So then we took some blood samples. The blood samples uh, was about 20, 21, 22. It was okay in the blood but not in the milk. This is normal. Is there any specific reason for this one? What do you think about this? Well, that's interesting. That's, that's, I'm really not the best person to ask that question of, frankly, um, you wouldn't expect to see that much of a disconnect, at least in my experience. Um, that's odd. Um, the one thing I will say about months, so, so I, the short answer is I can't answer that question very well. I apologize. But in general, but with MUNS, of course, the, the diet formulation, right, is going to affect it. Um, but also think about in general, we've seen this with some of the work that Heather Dan has been doing with Dave Barbano, uh, feed availability also affects MUNS a lot. And I don't know if that would play into some of this or not. Um, other people yeah, on the line might be able to 24 hours in front of the cows. You know, this is yeah, no problem. So, no, so I, I really don't know. That's interesting. That, I'm sure there's an answer to that. I, I just don't know it. Yeah. So we check the labs results if they were the analyzing right or not. Uh, you know, still we are going to work on this one. It is very, yeah. it was very interesting. You know, this is the first time I noticed this kind of things. I yeah, see some Alex. Alex yeah, go Alex ahead. suggested maybe it was a lab or a sampling issue. Yeah, because biologically, I would struggle with that to explain it. Yeah. Okay, I have one other question. You know, during your farm tour. Yes. So what is the direction of your barns, east to west or north to south? Unfortunately, they're north to south. Um, and then part of that was uh, years ago, lining them up with the, with the pre-existing buildings, but also where the, the tree line is, the forest and so forth. So um, in our area, east-west orientation would be ideal, um, but we've, we've, been, we've accommodated north-south by putting up some shades and so forth that help block sun, especially on the west as it begins to set later in the afternoon so that cows still use some of those outer stalls and so forth. But uh, still, we, did, we get pretty good ventilation and we use a lot of fans. Yeah, I noticed yeah. this. Also, the insulation yeah. is good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the insulation really helped a lot. I didn't make a big deal out of that, and I'm not an ag engineer for sure, but I recall back in the early 2000s, like 2003, when we were designing the first barn I, in the the ag engineers had a lot of great input, but to a person, they all said, don't put up an insulated barn. It's, it's the wrong thing to do, make it a cold barn. Um, and that would have been fine too, but actually the insulation, as I said, except for a very few days when it's really cold and there is condensation inside, uh, that's true. But most of the time it's, it's great. And during the summer, even though we just have episodic heat stress, I'm pretty sure that that, uh, Insulated ceiling does help lessen the heat load in the barn. And then, of course, we just used large 52 inch fans and, and it keeps lots of air movement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Hudai, to come back to your um, question about the MUNs, um, James Aldrich says that maybe it's the way the milk samples were handled. Urease enzyme can break down urea and milk. And he thinks he's just remembering that from a long time ago. Yeah, so. that's great. That comes back to sampling stuff. Um, 
so uh, Sean, I Hi. am people, I will get to your questions and I'm so sorry, Sean. <laughs> um, Hi. Nice Good to morning. see you. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, hi, uh, Rick. It's a great uh, um, presentation. Um, excellent information. And also, Bill brought up a very nice comments. And it made me, uh, made me think uh, about a few things. First, actually, it's about the chimney. I, I, I heard uh, Rick mentioned about the chimney. Uh, recently, I learned something from uh, well, for a Canadian buying designer, and uh, he actually explained explain to me about the chain, how the chimney works. And even now, um, I, he here there's a Canadian buying design company. They promote this design. It's very good, actually. Um, even in minus 40 here in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba, or some places in China, the chimney works uh, excellent in the winter and mm -hmm. also very nice in summer. The design looks weird from inside. You see the, the pipes, the how like one meter long pipes inside. But actually the way we designed, <laughs> it, it, it's very efficient, especially the temperature difference between outside and the inside is larger. The chimney will work like a more powerful it's 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 very good design actually. Yeah, um, I, I regarding agree. the yeah. yeah, okay, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, I I do, uh, another thing is it, I learned a lot between when you and the Bill discussed about um, the time management and Maria, uh, you guys played that tool. It's it's very good. Uh, actually, in, in China. Quite a few large dairies, they're trying to have uh, uh, four milkings for fresh cows, especially. Um, but some farms, uh, it works pretty good. If you increase from three milking to four milkings and you get more milk and the cows are doing just fine. And, but some farms, they don't. And uh, actually, uh, after you guys discussion, I realized and just like what Rick mentioned, it's about like uh, the, the most important factor, maybe is the time budget. Um, some farms, the design makes the, the cows spend much more time outside farm when you adjust from three milking to four milking. And it, it for sure, you know, uh, affect uh, the cows resting time. And uh, so the whole time, budget is messed up then for those dairies doesn't matter how hard they, they do other things but just because of the way they the the, the farm design the distance between milk parlor to the barn they just can't manage that so maybe they should stick to a three milkings for all their cows Absolutely. And just, just to interject, there, I don't know of any research per se, but I know I've worked with enough dairy herds. And this is probably more like five to 10 years ago when going to 4X in the fresh pen was more of a hot topic, you know, when it first came out. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are trying it and getting very mixed results. And, and almost to a herd, the ones that I knew about, it had to do with time outside the pen and or distance from the, from the parlor. And of course, those two are, are related. OK, and so to me, it just it just reinforced the fact that, again, from the cow's perspective, she has to have the time to do it. It's, it sounds trivial to say yeah. it, but but if there's not enough time inside the pen to eat and lie down, uh, that's got to be fixed first or else nothing else matters. And for sure, spending a lot of time formulating a perfect ration does not matter. Right. So, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, another thing is about the feeding, um, three times feeding or some farms, especially um, if they can manage in, 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 the, in the summer when cows suffering from heat stress, they change to four times feeding. Uh, they, or they try to deliver more feed in, in, in the evening when, when temperature is a bit lower. Do you think that that's a good practice? Yeah, well, here's what I would say with, with heat stress, of course, you do need to think about 
ways to maintain intake. All right. And so you can think about moving around feeding mm -hmm. times and so forth. And certainly looking at greater feeding frequency delivery, uh, greater frequency of delivery of TMR, right? Um, that's important. Yeah. And, and your, your goal is to keep the TMR as fresh as possible to avoid heating and refermenting, right? Um, yeah. But I, and so, so that's, that's job number one. And then you think about some of Kevin Harvatine's work. And, and, and if you go back and look at his work, I, I still think that feeding in the nighttime when it's cooler can be a, can be a benefit, but we can't make, we can't just move to a point of feeding the majority of the feed at night. I don't think, because if I'm recalling Kevin's work accurately, he would say that actually maybe you, you, you overall, you reduce dry matter intake when you take that strategy and actually cows eat faster at night, uh, the same amount of feed than they would during the day. So their feeding behavior isn't as natural as you'd like it, mm -hmm. but still during heat stress, you do need to look at feeding more times a day. And, and perhaps moving more of the dry matter intake to the cooler times of the day. The only yeah. point I'd make generally, if I can just say one more thing would be, um, if you go above four times a day, particularly if it's not heat stress, you need to really have a way of monitoring resting time. Because mm -hmm, I don't, mm -hmm. maybe you've probably seen that, that summary slide. And in fact, it's part of the reason why we have that feeding frequency implemented in this management tool, right? If, if you go above four or five times a day feeding, in most studies, it's reduced uh, intake and in milk production, okay? Where are we they going, wanted, right? it, it reduces <laughs> resting time. What's that? Is this your summary slide? That's it, but what I'm, I'm, I'm looking at mentally at a slide that I don't have in the slide set, oh, so okay. sorry. But, but the bottom <laughs> line is you just need to think about resting versus time spent at the bunk eating. And I will say this, once, twice, three times a day is fine. Four times a day during heat stress may be warranted, but try not to go much above that unless you are monitoring resting time. Because in too many cases, the, the studies have shown that you reduce resting time and the net effect on the cow is, is a loss in overall lactation performance. Okay. Sorry about that long answer, but I... <laughs> that's excellent <laughs> answer actually. Um, um, last question is: uh, I like to hear your comments about uh, deep sand bathing and rubber mat. I, I noticed you have one bar; you still keep the rubber mats plus the um, sand dust, uh, the sawdust. Yes. And you complain about you know the wind blow the sawdust. Uh, a way is hard to manage. Besides that, um, more comments about these two approaches. Yeah, well, from the cow again, from the cow's perspective, the data is really clear. Um, whether you have sand or sawdust or some other bedding, um, what they really notice are two things. One is the depth of the bedding, so we say deep bedded. And I just talked mm -hmm. about this to another group yesterday. It should be about ten centimeters or about four inches. From the cow's perspective, that would be deep, right? It doesn't need to be mm -hmm. deeper than that. doesn't seem to confer any greater uh, benefit to the cow. So 10 centimeters. Yes. Um, that's easier to do in a sand bed for sure. And we've struggled really hard to keep anywhere close to that much sawdust on our platforms because of just natural wind. But also as soon as we turn on the fans, it just blows it. <laughs> it tends to blow it off the, 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 um, the platforms. Uh, so I think, I think any mattress barn with sawdust or any, any sawdust bedded barn is going to have that challenge of trying to keep deep bedded, uh, deep bedding. It, it's just, it's really hard to do. So you, you, you have to manage for poor hock scores and maybe a little more lameness. And you certainly need to be more diligent on grooming your stalls and pulling sawdust back to take the place of that, which has been blown away or, or removed. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you notice that first barn we built in 04, uh, at that point, the powers that be at the Institute were saying, well, um, we just don't want to deal with sand, what it does to <laughs> equipment. And so of all places, we made the decision for equipment, not for the cows, right? So after I say my Hail Marys, I'll get past that. But, but since then, everything we've built has been sand and the cows really do, the cows look different. It's almost like a, it got garbled, but I said, it's like having two farms or two farms in one. We have, a, we have a mattress and sand barn and we have a sand farm or barn. And it's, it's really night and day difference between the two. 
Well, it, it gives yeah. you a really good opportunity to show on one farm with other similar management how that can differ too. Mm -hmm. So, so one, one key number here is 10 centimeters. Um, really, you need something like make a soft, uh, uh, like 10 centimeter uh, distance for cow to, to, to put their body comfortably on. That, that you mentioned 10 centimeter sand. So if anything, you need to create that kind of soft layer. Is that right? That's right. And so what I'm saying is theoretically, you could do that with something yeah. other than sand, right? With the right kind of yeah. stall design. I rarely see it sometimes, like like in some tie, box, tie stall barns, actually, I've seen it around mm -hmm. here where people put some sort of a, of a um, barrier in the back to allow more inches of sawdust remain in the bed. Uh, and, yeah. and, and it's comfortable. Yeah. Then it has some challenges relative to keeping it clean but it's comfortable. I think overall, yeah. there's a reason why we've, we've evolved toward a deep bedded sand, right? So who From says it's comfortable? Perspective. What's Rick, that? Do you lay down in it? I, no, I'm, I'm serious. Well, the cow uh, says, yeah, yes, yes, yes. you could. Well, yeah. there's, there's the old, you notice I didn't do this. There's the old drop knee test and the wet yeah, knee test. Yeah, and, yeah, Vadim did that. Yeah, that would have created too much fun, I suppose, <laughs> especially if you picked out the stall for me to do that in. Yes. But um. Mm -hmm. But I think what the cows tell you, and that's what people in research have, have noticed, like preference, first of all, if they have a choice, what, what kind of bed do they choose? How long do they lie down? That sort of thing. Look at their hock scores or lameness um, and look at their resting time. That, that's, that's how the cow tells you. And there's so much research in that area. Um, and, and to summarize it all, that basically if you have... Uh, Four, excuse me, four inches, 10 centimeters or more from the cow's perspective, she's gotten what she will or what she can out of deep bedded stalls. So. Uh, are you, are you set, um, Sean? Sean? I think so. Oh, okay. So I just, I, I appreciate that these webinars get really long when we have this back right, and forth. And, and I'm hope, hoping that people um, who have to leave because they have other things they have to do are, are aware that they can just drop back because I think these discussions are part of what my goal was for these. So um, Sean, unless you, are, unless you have more questions, I'll get to some of the questions I have in my window. Yeah, that, that's all. That's all. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much yeah. for your comments. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. yeah, no problem. So coming back to um, some of the comment, the discussions you were having about the um, t number of times of feeding, uh, just a comment to share with all the rest of the attendees from Alex. Then um, stable TMR and preventing heating of TMR for cow, because cows do not like putting their nose in a TMR greater than body temperature, which is easy when a moist TMR heats up, especially in the summer. Yeah, I, that for sure. You that's that's one of the first challenges is making sure that the 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 quality right of the TMR stays consistent during hot weather, anytime, but particularly during hot weather. If you have heating occurring, you need to get it out of there, right? Change your feeding frequency. Do something to keep fresh feed in front of the cow. Fresh in terms of cool, right? Um, yeah, I, like, so, I, like, I like the way he says body temperature. I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, I hadn't but, either. But, uh, perfect. But for sure, I mean, if you, we, we, most, of, most of us aren't very quantitative, but if you put your hand in a, in a TMR and it's warm, you know that, that needs to be, something needs to be changed, either in terms of the bunk management, the feed bunk management, or even coming off the silo phase, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, so Alex has a couple other um, questions that I want to address sort of as a group, but so I'm going to do a couple that we have and then come back to some of the questions he has. Um, so April says, how are you weighing your cows? Um, they have a flat mobile digital scales and they're trying to get it positioned to weigh cows and just wondering how you slow down the cows enough to record weights. Oh, well, we're, we're so lucky, April. Yeah, that, that would be a challenge so you get accurate weights, right? Because probably 
inaccurate weights might be worse than guessing. <laughs> I don't know. But in, in, we didn't get, we actually, we didn't go through that barn when Mary Ann was here because we were running out of time. But we have, since it's a research place, we have chutes, several chutes and cows. We, we walk the cows down the chute and basically the, the weighing platform is surrounded by a uh, chute. So we have uh, doors front and back. The cow can walk on. We can take the, an accurate body weight and then let her off and she continues on. So um, that's how we do it on our particular farm. Okay. Um, to channel Monty Python, now for something completely different. Can you address fly control at minor, good, bad, and how, um, how that works? Yeah, sure. I don't, that's not really something I stick my nose into in too much detail. But I, I do know that in general, uh, well, we, feed, we feed Clarify. That's probably one of the first things to say. And it seems to work really well in our herd. Okay. So you try to nip the problem in the bud so to speak, that doesn't, that metaphor doesn't even make sense, but yeah, you, know what, a, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Is that, that something available um, around, is that something that's able to be used um, worldwide or is that? I don't know. Yeah, I, don't know. I, assume, I assume it would be, um, it's yeah. very commonly used for sure. But beyond that, and so I think that's a significant part of it, right? But also we, our, our farm management tries really hard. And this is probably the most important thing to just, get rid of um, breeding, breeding sites for flies. So we don't have standing water. We try not to have places where there's a lot of standing, you know, old manure around the barns. We try to keep the grass, you know, trimmed and cut back. Um, just basic management like that. So if you eliminate the breeding spots, it sounds obvious, but they really do a pretty good job of that. And then I believe we have, have a company come in to do some targeted spraying as needed throughout the the fly season here, right? But it works pretty well for, with very few exceptions. We don't typically have a, a, a huge fly problem. We know when we do, because if we see cow bunching, sometimes that's what's causing, right? These heel flies. And, and those, are, those are buggers, uh, even though you try your best to try to keep the fly population under control. All right. Mm -hmm. So that's my best answer. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a fly expert though. I just it notice is. when they're there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But no, and then as we were walking around the barn, granted it was cooler and um, but it it was delightful. It, very tidy and and I know research facilities better be, but um, it, it was a very nice facility to be walking around. Um, so Alex has sort of some really good um, questions that breaking, breaking some of your, your indices out in terms of um, lactation, first calf heifers, multiparous, what, um, or multiparous, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Um, I, let's, let's start giving a whack at those. Um, in terms of your indices, uh, what would you say on, is, are there differences for feeding frequency, push up, resting time, things like that? Yeah. Well, to this point, at least for myself, based on the data I'm, I'm familiar with, I don't often break it up by parity. Um, I mean, certainly like say with resting time as an example, I, I could pull up a slide which shows that there are differences. Yeah. You know, there, across stages of lactation, of course, and there's some differences by parity, right? Certainly a, a mature cow of say a cow and fourth lactation might have a little bit of different resting time than uh, first calf heifer, but in general, they're not huge, right? Um, same thing, and I think the effect of feeding frequency would be maybe even more important with the first calf heifer because one thing that does differ on the, resting time doesn't differ a lot, but feeding time uh, and the cow's ability to adjust for greater competition at the bunk certainly does differ by parity. Uh, you know, so first calf heifers are far less able to adjust their meal patterns and feeding rate to accommodate greater competition. So if you, I don't know that I have a, a different set of uh, feeding frequency guidelines, for instance, Marianne or, or Alex, but I do take a harder look at pens that which I know are mixed parity pens. Right. And so they, they, I maybe mentally, I just not kind of nudge the bar up a little bit. So if I'm saying feed push up six to eight times a day, I might really take a look at if I could 
in the hours after feeding, what's really happening? Are these, watch the first cat peppers, are they getting up there? Are they eating, right? Uh, so it's not so much that I would change maybe the, the metrics, but I might mentally set the bar a little bit higher if I know they're mixed parity pens, right? If the primaparis pen is separate and it's not overcrowded, then I probably wouldn't adjust my, in, my metrics very much. Mm -hmm. Does um, does rumen size affect the feeding frequency or the number of minutes for ruminate, ruminations per day? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> yeah. And well, and, well it, and, and in and in and, um, in, can, in in reference to that, you know, a first calf heifer versus a, a mature yeah. cow, that, that would be a difference. Right. Well, so rumen size, I'd say, is related to the size of the animal for sure, and you know, and so larger animals that eat more, you know, they have greater dry matter intake capacity. They have to ruminate more, obviously, because there's more total dry matter to process, right? Uh, for sure. Um, and I see that there's this rumen size effect feeding fre frequency just popped up there. Um, it, I gotta think about that one. I'm not sure. You could sure. get some jerseys sure. and test it. What's that? You could get some jerseys and test it. I suppose, but then you've got a got genetics in there too and plus jerseys are just kind of strange sorry but <laughs> but, but no but the basic question that, that Alex is driving at here is, is room and size or body size do you make adjustments with some of your management like feeding frequency if you have bigger cows um my guess is if you're if you're feeding say two once twice three times a day um a larger animal can eat more at one time um, I'm not sure if it would make a difference. I think still the metrics that we have would be, would be pretty much where I would stay. Um, not sure that may, that maybe isn't the best answer, but that's, that's a thought provoking way to think about it, Alex, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, should, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It's, no, no, no. I was coming to the next question. Um, sure, sure. but so this is, this is somewhat of a, you know, ponder this. Do you think that naturally a cow needs to stand because it lies down too long and she would not be able to move and that movement helps um, helps absorption of fermentation VFAs. Cows just cows are not at the top of the food chain and do they need to be nimble uh, even in <laughs> high stall. <laughs> yeah. yeah well I got a standing desk this year and it helps. Um, right. Anyways in tie stalls cows stand and move more frequently don't they? Um, is it because of hunger or a need to move? Well, I think different motivations make an animal move, right? Uh, no doubt about that. And I'm not enough of a purithologist to jump into that water very deeply. But I will say this, that, that that's kind of just an interesting thought provoking question. Um, for sure, cows need mobility. They need to have an environment where they can stand up, move around, preferably move around, um, exercise their joints, and their muscles and all that sort of thing. And there, there's actually some pretty good literature in that. And what I'm thinking, what I think about is the exercise literature. Um, we don't focus on that very much, but uh, cows that have adequate access to exercise um, versus those that don't have better physical fitness, they do better on treadmill tests. For instance, and Dave Beatty did some great work on that about 10, 15 years ago at Michigan State. And there's a lot of older data now, maybe 20 years old or so, for the cow that's getting close to parturition, if they're, they're allowed adequate exercise or more mobility, right, not as constrained in their environment, their, their physical environment, they have much better health, right, joint health, less metabolic problems, and overall probably lower call rates early in lactation than those that don't have adequate exercise. So that's probably the way I would come at this particular question. I'll add one more thing. There's a paper, I, I, pick, I mentioned this a lot in my talks, and they looked at what factors across many farms are most highly associated with the welfare of the animal and her productivity. And I can remember the top four that they pointed out would be making sure that the stalls are comfortable, making sure the, the feeding system is adequate, and that makes sense. But then number three in their list was exercise. <laughs> and I think that fits right in with this question. Okay, does a cow get enough movement mobility, right, in her daily activity, her daily time budget. And by the way, I think about the research would say about two hours per day, if you're walking around outside 
with, with normal interactions is, is what a cow needs. And so we bring that cow indoors and is she getting it? Is she getting it? So that, that, that's, a, that's a great question to have over a beer sometime. Yeah, and I, I think we yeah. can just take some of the stuff we know from humans and apply it across species. I, I remember being incredibly frustrated with the lack of information back when I had my first baby. They, they were so vague about colostrum and milk production. And having taken that in college, I'm like, are you kidding me? Of course the baby needs to drink that. Um, and I, I don't think we do that enough. It just you know, step away and, and think what makes sense. Um, but anyway, uh, Rick, so I was intrigued by your, um, your mention of Dennis Armstrong's research that mm -hmm. showed a 10% e increase in efficiency. Um, same dry matter intake, um, yes. but more production. And I'm thinking on some slides that I was reviewing that Jude Capper's work in um, the UK, where she's looking at just things that, you know, there's so much talk about what we need to do to decrease our carbon footprint or our, our environmental impact as dairy producers or as um, cattlemen. Um, this seems to me to be a very strong point. I remember also in her slides, the reference that um, BST increased efficiency by 10%. Well, this is a, this looks like it's a non, um, non debatable way to, to do that. And to- uh, The optics are pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> if you, the public perception is pretty good. But I mean, and it, it was one small study. I don't want to overemphasize it, but it's there, whether it's 10% or 5% or whatever it is, it makes sense that it's positive because all you're doing is keeping feed in front of the cow when it's most likely to be pushed back and there's the most aggressive uh, eating and competition occurring at the bunk, right? So I could think of any number of biological uh, mechanisms that would explain that greater digestive efficiency. It wasn't measured in the study, but you can imagine several mechanisms that explain it, right? And so something like that, and that's something that can be implemented on, on any dairy, right? That, that feeds cows at a fence line. Well, I'm wondering if there needs to be um, maybe some uh, re-examination of that and more looking at it, because those are the sort of studies that we need to focus on to mm -hmm. have, um, have tools to right. Im improve efficiency and keep people thinking that cows and, and um, meat deserves to be in the, in the world. For sure. Um, That's what I've been calling. We need to step back, look at the data, look at the cows, and then I, I just say reassess industry norms, right? Um, some norms are great. And, and, you know, Bill was talking about that right out of the chute, that some norms, I think some of the things we've been doing um, maybe haven't led us to the right endpoint, <laughs> and we can change. Um, by the way, <laughs> unless somebody has more questions, I'll just leave you all with this. And Rick, unless you have more, um, and my co-hosts have something they would like to say. Radar, our cow, weighed um, 1650. And that's, oh golly, I can't do my metric conversion real fast. 740 kilograms. So you were off by, by 50 kilograms or so. Or 150 pounds. pounds. Don't make it sound worse than it was. Come on. <laughs> you the said she the was bottom line is it wasn't good anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> you thought you actually thought you were doing a high estimation or a low estimation. So um, yeah. she weighed less than you thought. There you go. Yep. That was one part that I'm glad got garbled. So I'm glad uh, you clarified that. For were everybody whacking man. away at the mic to make it garbled. <laughs> so. Anyway. All right. Well, um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. Rick, we'll see you back this afternoon. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just make a comment on the use of how you're measuring body weight. There is a protocol, like uh, measure how many times during lactation. I think it's necessary, but it's not easy sometimes, like uh, especially yeah. when you need to buy a scale or something like it. Uh, in a beef farm, I think uh, there would be no problem, but I sometimes we have a hard time, you know, have automation on that, scales on uh, after the milking 
parlors and but you I say we have a lot of tools and you have like what have you done and what do you see that works and how would you do it like basically yeah well there, there's a lot of ways that people could do that of course in our own farm uh, we're fortunate we can we can get body weights almost all the time right and I, and I realize that's not a commercial dairy <laughs> right but we have the, the technical staff and we're always doing research but I, I would think you know in general the, the minimal number of times would be where you, where you have the need to, to really capture a realistic body weight for the purposes of ration formulation and you know, predicting dry matter intake. And so I know, for instance, in our case, whether we were a research herd or not, we would certainly be getting a body weight uh, right after calving, right, as, as part of sort of the fresh cow checks and so forth. So that would be one spot right there. And then we, we would typically... Um, even for cows that aren't on a research trial, we try to get a, something, say, after peak lactation, uh, just, to, just to get an idea of what the cow would be like She's after she's moving back into positive energy balance and body weight is coming up maybe more toward mid-lactation. And then again, a dry off. Those, those would be some of the minimal ones for me um, that, that we would focus on here at the Institute. And I think it would certainly be useful for people who are working on a commercial dairy I'd be curious, do you have yourself any suggestions or what do you typically do? No, at home I have a scale. So we, we measure like every three to four months, the entire herd. Yeah. But I know far that measured only after calving. Some people measure like twice a year. The yeah. question is using the girth perimeter. Like, he, like so, so I've, I've done it a couple of times, developing a mm -hmm. linear regression with like weight some cows in the farm, get the girth yep. perimeter in centimeter, not using the body weight. So make a regression. It's usually, usually has a 0.95 R square, something like that. I think it, it, it's helpful. That's excellent. Um, that, that, that relationship. Yeah. yeah. I think because like, obviously have, if like, you were, oh, go ahead. Yeah, by the way, like uh, some people here, they're selling like uh, water trouts that have a scale. So every time a cow goes to drink and like these people have been using it a lot for them, it's, it's very useful because they can decide the precise time to to slaughter the animal. But for mm -hmm. dairy, like here, uh, it's much more difficult to have this kind of things. Yeah. There are scales on the, uh, after the milking parlor that measures every day, but the, I, I don't know if people have been really, if you really need to measure that thing so frequently. So the investment wow. in the equipment is the kind of, of high. But yeah. uh, I, see, I, I think it's really important. That's a big point. Like uh, you always try to do better, but not always. I think uh, at least a girth perimeter would, is better than nothing. Eh? If, but uh, if we could have scales and I think it would be much more precise, I, I hope. But I, I, I am not sure if it pays the investment. Like if yeah. we can get really much better and, and to push productivity or to decrease costs. And so it's a kind of, but, it, it, but uh, I think it's very important. Uh, really I agree. I, <laughs> two, two things that occur to me. One is if, you, if you're using some sort of an approach that that's maybe uh, predictive or something that can be great unless it's not accurate. And what you just des described sounds very accurate. Um, but the other thing I know not as much anymore, but we used to know a lot of farms that would just get their ideas of body weights from animals that left the herd. <laughs> and, and very rarely are those typical body weights, right? Because a cow leaves the herd for specific yeah, reasons and, and typically her body weights not reflected. So I'd really caution people about not relying on those sort of weights. Yeah, but that's an. I think that's an important thought. Like we have a lot of things to go there. Like when with all this precision nutrition thing, and see, we use the most powerful software. We have all the equations, but the by the way, it is a visual observation most of the times. <laughs> very, yeah. I think very few nutritionists really weigh cows. Like. No. Uh, it's and a, I was... uh, and it, it's a it's a big piece of the calculation. <laughs> It, yeah, um, it certainly is. We had a session at the Cornell Nutrition Short Course that covered that quite a bit. And I know we've, we've sort of tried to hammer that home on several of our webinars. 
Um, Marcos, do you have another question, perhaps? Yeah, I, I do, but if you want to go and ask Yeah, Paul, I think I better, uh, I better ask. I, 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 I'll, I'll come back. Huh? Yeah, we'll come back to you. I think I'll ask a couple questions, and then we'll get some questions from Paula. I think she has quite a few. Um, so we had a question, and Rick, I think I didn't get a good um, shot of it on the video. Um, the feed, the feed um, bunk area, is that um, epoxy coated or tile? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I did see that question before you, you, you removed it. So um, I didn't really I remove it. I just was making you, this guy's from Turkey and he's like, it's one o'clock there. <laughs> OK, so well, anyway, we, obviously we have tile and it works fine. But if I understood his question, it was epoxy or tile is, is one better than the other. And I don't think so. I think the key thing there is just whatever surface you have, make sure it's smooth. That's the key thing, right? Tight and in good repair. And that, that goes back to um, some Purdue work from decades and decades ago where they could easily see one to two more pounds of dry matter intake when you had a resurfaced, refurbished uh, feeding platform versus a, a, you know, an acid etched or pitted concrete uh, feeding, feeding surface. So um, yeah, tile epoxy, there, there's a lot of things that people can do to make that work. Okay. Um, what is, I'll ask, I'll ask my few questions and then we'll let Paula have a go. Um, your opinion on using dry manure or compost for free stalls? Mm, okay, that's an interesting question. Yeah. And I, to, I'll, I'll say up front, I'm not the world's best expert on manure. <laughs> my wife would disagree, but um, <laughs> And I sling it pretty well, but well, actually a number of herds in our area do use either, you know, composted solids or, or some sort of dried manure solids. Um, and they work really well. As far as I know, when they're properly, uh, when they're done properly, okay. Uh, there's really no measurable difference between, let's say health of the animal, you know, um, mastitis, somatic cell counts, uh, comfort lying time. There's no difference between these and, and deep bedded sand, as long as they're managed properly. Um, they tend to be more, they have, they have greater moisture for sure. So you have to be a good manager. But anything I can recall would be for sure, you really have to make sure that your, your teed end prep is, is on, on target, should be anyway, but for sure with some of these solids, because they have a lot of fine particles that can cling to the teed end if you're not careful. Um, and the only other thing I'll say, so, but and comfort from, from a comfort standpoint, they're fine. They're very comfortable, but sometimes I've noticed that we had, I was on a herd last year, two years ago because of COVID, I guess, um, 2019 seems like last year to me. Uh, and they had a lot of white cows for whatever reason. And they were all kind of stained a little bit of a, of a yellowish brown color. Um, it wasn't affecting milk quality. They had great resting times, but I just didn't like the looks of them, but, um, that, that'd be my answer. They, they, they can work just as well as sand by any metric if they're properly managed and the cows yeah. find them, cows find them comfortable. Again. Um, oh yeah. And Rick, you have to speak slowly. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no. I need to... <laughs> yeah. Um, translation, you know, I'm just going to throw in another plug for jerseys there. You, you don't have issues with that. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that reminder, Marianne. I'll, I'll, I will slow down. I'm a, native New Yorker, so I speak fast, but that's not a good excuse. Good, good. Um, a we've got a couple questions on the cow budget, and I'm sure Paula has some of those, um, but I'll ask what I have, and then we'll, we'll get to, we'll let Paula have a go. Um, how many times do you have to push up feed if you feed um, one times versus three times a day, two, two times, two times a day, three, one times a day. I'm not sure. I'm not entirely following that. You can see the question, how it's yeah, raised. I, th I, I think I, I understand it, Mary. Yeah. Uh, so let's just say what the person I think is, is asking would be if you just fed, let's say you had 60 pounds of dry matter. Uh, and if you, you just put that in front of the cows all at once, so you fed the TMR once, and then you managed it throughout the day, sort of like we're doing right now in our herd, okay? Or let's say you broke it up into two 30-pound 
feedings or you delivered three 20 pound, right? See what I'm saying? Yep. Um, and so I, I don't think you changed the number of push-ups necessarily. You might, but I think the big thing here would be when you would do that first push-up after the cows are having a meal. So when they come back from the parlor or when you've delivered, made, made, a, made a TMR delivery, um, if there's less being augered out into the bunk, naturally, I think the cows will be able to push that back a little bit quicker. It will, it will get out of their reach more rapidly and the management on the farm should be ready to, to push it up more quickly, mm -hmm. right? Than if they just fed all of it at once. Uh, there it becomes a matter in the early hours of just uh, pushing it up, but also just making sure that sorting isn't occurring, right? Because at that much feed at one time, if it's, if it's a sortable diet, that can really encourage cows to do that, right? right. They, they can dig these holes that I was showing and that's just natural feeding behavior. They, they sort of make a hole and it's almost like they've studied engineering and they know what kind of a slope to create to just start sorting feed. And the more feed that's there, the better job they can do at sorting if it's a ration that allows that. Mm -hmm. So, so not maybe, maybe so short answer, um, they'd have to think about when they do that, that push up. Okay more than how many times a day. All right, um, I'll do this one and then Paula. Now, Paula informs me that Spanish is 120% longer than English. Wow. So you're aware. <laughs> and she has probably, she has probably um, checked it out. So um, let's see if, what happens with a cow's budget when you feed more than three times a day? Um, times per meal decrease and feeding bouts increase? Question. Um, do you want me to go to the management tool? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think that's going to address this one. Okay. No, it does, actually it doesn't because um, feeding frequency is not the most uh, useful part of that tool. It's more stocking density and time budgeting. Mm -hmm. But what this question is getting to, um, so first of all, yes, it, generally speaking, when you deliver feed more often, um, you're going to encourage more meals, right? Because there's no, of, of all the different things you do on a farm that can encourage a cow to take another meal, delivery of fresh feed is the number one, uh, the, the number one factor. Then also you have return from the parlor and sometimes feed push up. Okay, but mostly it's delivery of feed. That's the biggest factor that drives another meal. Um, and that's good. From the rumen standpoint, the more times that the cow, the more meals a cow consumes in a day, the better her rumen fermentation will be. We all learned that, I think, in all of our nutrition courses. But from a cow's time budget standpoint, I would just offer this caution. Um, if a cow is spending more time at the bunk eating, that's good, only if it doesn't cause her to have to give up some resting time. And there's data that I didn't share today, but where they've looked at four times, five times a day feeding, and actually resting time goes down significantly and overall intake and milk production decline, go down even though they're feeding more times a day. And so I think we need to just think about the rumen and, and more, if you could feed 24 times a day, that would be perfect for the rumen every hour, but that rumen is in a cow <laughs> and we need to think about that cow's time budget and her ability or her need to get adequate rest as well as eat. Okay, so I think once, mm -hmm. twice, three times a day is where you should be in most of our dairies. Okay. Um, are you Could, ready? Could you, can you check? Am I, am I speaking slow enough? I think slow. Um, we're going to let Paula talk to you now and she will either praise you or scold you. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Go ahead, Paula. Hi, Rick. <laughs> Hi, Hello. Marian. That's not my fault. It's the, the other Paula is the translator. She, she has to 
speed up the, the talking. I'm sorry about that. Okay, uh, the first question we have is about the height of the wall of the feed bank and the upper railing, or maybe you can give us some reference, some material to, to have those numbers. Okay, so you're talking about um, the, 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 the wall behind the feed bunk? Yes, I think so. Well, I, would, I guess um, that, that's maybe something I would send to you, because like I said, I'm not really an ag engineer. Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily have that information right at, right, you know, handy. The throat height, though, for a lot of our mature cows might be, you know, um, maybe, maybe I'm trying to think in terms of metric system, but throat height for a post and rail feeding might be maybe half a meter or something like that. But I can send you, I'll send it to Marianne. I've, I've got some very exact numbers that vary by body weight. Uh, so that person can can get a very specific answer. Okay. Is that, okay. Is that okay? You. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, I, last last year or a couple of years ago, we went to Wisconsin uh, to the university and we've been with uh, David Camel. And I think he, he works with those measurements with the engineering of, of the stall. And maybe I can add some information about that. Oh, yeah, all that information is very readily available on, online. Uh, and Wisconsin is one of the best sources. Uh, if you go to e either, you said Dave Hamill, and also the, uh, what's it called? The Dairy Initiative, I think, uh, there, yes. that, that the vet school runs. They have all of that information for sure. And it's all by body size. Okay, perfect. Yep. So uh, I have a question about stocking density. Mm -hmm. Should it vary uh, during summer and winter time? Uh, assuming we mitigate the heat the best, the, the best we can. Yeah, well, <laughs> ideally, well, yeah, ideally if we're not overcrowded, it, it wouldn't matter, right? So really the question is, should we should we overcrowd less during certain times of the year? Is that that's the question, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, well, I would say this: if um, during heat stress, that is no doubt one of the worst times to overcrowd cows. All right, because uh, I didn't go into it a lot during the walk around, but um, overcrowding has a greater effect on reducing rumen pH, I did mention that, than even changing dietary fiber within normal ranges. So a good way to really cause low rumen pH or SERA is to overcrowd the bunk or the stalls. We also know that heat stress is another good way to reduce rumen pH. There's some really classic old data from Missouri which shows that. Um, so if you put the two together, you can have just really horrible rumen conditions relative to rumen pH, okay? And also we know that uh, heat stress uh, also would, uh, re would, would affect the cow's normal resting behavior, right? She's gonna stand more trying to cool off. And if you combine that with overcrowding, that's going to just amplify the risk for uh, lameness. So I would say I, if you can adjust stocking density I would certainly want to reduce the stocking density of the stalls and the headlocks or feed bunk uh, during times of heat stress, for sure. Okay, great. Do you, yeah, does, do you want to, um, Paula, do you want to do a couple more? Then I'll ask mine and I'll see if, um, if Marcos has more questions. Okay, yes, I have. I know you have a lot. Many, many questions. <laughs> Okay, I go with one more. Uh, could you explain uh, a little bit more about the stall usage index? How, how does it vary in time in relation to feeding and milking? And could you repeat the values we should look for? 
And the last, could you tell us the reference of the paper you addressed? Uh, yes, um, that's actually, that'd be useful if I can, if I could pull up that, um, do you have access to that, Marianne? Or um, what, what, what is that? It's, it's the Word document. That oh, has yes, this. I do. I have actually that close to hand. I can pull that up. Yep. Now, the, um, I, again, I can be, um, oops. Yep. And I, we, we are going to send this out as a PDF. Oh, good. When, good. Um, when I send all the rest of the other stuff. So let me share a new screen yes i i think I, I don't have that file yeah i i have the other one yes okay do you um okay this is so what i just sent you so if you just keep scrolling marianne let me, I, i've got to make my screen a little bit bigger so i can see it okay there we go and so they're asking about the stall use index which is coming okay. up right now and that right. overton if you get to the you don't have to do it right now you can stop right there but um at the end of this uh pop, there are references and so the okay. person can, can look that reference up okay yep. so all of the different indices are referenced at the, at the end of this document which i think will be shared with you yep okay uh, okay perfect yes and so typically and, and this can be done you know like i said during a time of if you wait during during a quiet time in the pen um this is the best time to do any of these including the stall use index and it's based on the assumption that not all the cows can lie down at the same time when the pen is overcrowded, of course. And so really what it's saying is, because the numerator are the, are the cows that are lying in the, in the stalls. Then the denominator are all of the cows in the pen minus those that are actively eating. So especially when you're overcrowded, uh, even though the meal, maybe the feed was delivered an hour or two hours ago, there's still going to be some cows eating because they might be subordinate cows or it's just taking them longer to get to the bunk, right? So they're not wasting their time. And that's my, that's how I would say it. Uh, they're not lying down, which would be ideal from her time budget standpoint, but they're not wasting their time. They're at least eating. And as I said, I think in the, in the taped part of my presentation, some nutritionists have said, well, if they're also drinking, you should take take them out too. And, I, and that's true. If you can measure, if you can see some cows that are drinking, you can subtract them off in the denominator as well, but it's mostly cows that are eating. So does that make sense? So if you're looking at it, you're really just trying to, to get a sense of she's not lying down, but if she's eating, at least she's doing something useful. But we hate to see her cows just sitting there, standing there in the alley, waiting for a stall to open up. Um, and I've got so much video, that, which just shows two or three, sometimes four animals waiting for a stall to open up. Um, they're not eating, they're not drinking, they're just putting stress on their feet, they're wasting their time. And, and that, those are the sort of herds where overcrowding has such a, such a negative effect. And I think the stall use index is the only tool we have which gives us a clear picture of that. Cow comfort index surely doesn't. Okay. Um, I'll have a Maybe. quick question. Um, Rick, for small farms on which it's impractical to have a fresh cow diet, do you think it's a good idea to feed the fresh cows the low cow diet in the morning and the high cow diet in the evening? Or what would you advise doing? Hmm, interesting question. So it's impractical to have a fresh cow diet. Um, I'm not sure about the low cow diet. I guess it depends on the strat on, on the formulation, but you know, most low cow diets are going to not have, I wouldn't think, have the nutrient concentration that a fresh cow is going to need. Um, it might almost be better if, if it's possible to feed the high cow diet and, and maybe put in some, uh, if, if they could have, even if it's free choice, have some uh, forage, like some long stemmed hay or something, right? Uh, just to just to keep their their room in full, make sure they're chewing adequately. I'm, I'm not. A, I wouldn't be a big fan of feeding at least the low cow diets we formulate. Would really, I think, make the, make the cow stall out a little bit in mm -hmm. terms of coming up on intake and not losing body condition, coming up on intake and milk. Um, if that makes sense. 
Um, I, and yeah, and I don't know, we then might, might provide more additional information or, yeah. or that might be a good, good answer. Um, Marcos, do you have any questions from your end? Yes, can I, let's make one. Uh, Rick, uh, could you comment how are you looking at carbohydrates in the diet, like in general for fiber and non-fiber carbohydrates, like in ration balancing, what, what, what numbers you pay attention to and what, like, what are your recommendations? Like, in, in so general, like, what do we focus on? Or, yeah. Yeah, well, like, well, Porridge and DF or NDF greater than eight millimeter, room and degrade we start. What are your goals and what you think uh -huh. is important? What you really measure, what you really look for. Okay. Okay, I'll give you the quick answer. Okay. That that'd be that'd be a great uh, webinar too. <laughs> yeah, and I think we can we but, yeah, we always I, like I, to I, have I, you I, back, I, Rick, I, but we'll try to <laughs> focus a lot yeah. on on cow um, yeah. on behavior management. Sort of but but I, I can give a just a yeah, really quick please. answer without taking up a lot of time. Uh -huh. but, uh, what we're what we've really been focusing on here, of course, there's the usual things. But from a from a carbohydrate standpoint, we've really been doing a lot of work looking at UNDF and particularly, of course, UNDF 240, then the then the fast and slow NDF. But um, then looking at UNDF 240 combined with particle size. So we've been calling it physically effective UNDF 240. And I think in AMTS, it's PE, was it carbohydrate C or something like that? Yeah, carbohydrate but, C. But, that, but anyway, because yeah. we, anyway. we found that, that that's so highly and tightly related to dry matter intake, at least with our database, where we have these corn silage and, and hay or hay crop silage based diets. And so we've really focused on, on that a lot. And, and I could, you know, in another time, I could go into a lot more detail on that. And then the other thing, our most recent work has really been looking at what is the best type of, you know, fermentability and level of starch as you're trying to optimize particle size and fiber degradability or undegradability. So this physically effective UNDF, uh, looking at starch and rumen fermentable starch. And what we, so we've been tracking things and we found that some of our, our best lactation diets actually, um, it does. I would say have more modest levels of rumen fermentable starch if we can get the fiber fermentability where we want it. So we've seen really good results with around 19 or 20% rumen fermentable starch. Sugars usually run around six to six and a half percent in our diets. And then, like I said, we really focus on particle size. As I said, um, that, that, that second box, the eight millimeter screen in the Penn State boxes or the 1.18 if you're doing ROTAP, we really focus on that. Um, I should probably stop there so I don't get in trouble. But uh, does that does that help? Yeah, yeah no, that, that's good. That's a, that's exactly. What I yeah. Uh, can I ask another one? Mary? Yes, please. Yeah, I think you made a good comment about the the sensors for rumination. The, you say that you are using the the SCRs. Yes, that's what we How have. How have you been? Yeah, how, how have you been really doing that on, in practice? Like, for example, would you recommend the farmer today to buy sensors to, to monitor rumination and to help on, I know they can help on yeast detection, they can find sick cows, but as a nutrition tool, like do, do you think that, at least in your experience, they are sensitive enough to, to change in the diet? Hmm. Okay. Well, what, I, what I would say. Like? I, I would say yes, as long as the farmer is going to use them, because of course they're expensive. Um, and and but it, but if a person is dedicated to using them, I will say this. So and I'm not. I'll just talk about measuring rumination and activity in general. Uh, I, not there, there's nothing specifically great about SCR. It's just the system we have. There's others. Um, and mm -hmm. our herds person, our, our herd health person. We actually have a veterinarian on staff. And he's told me many times, the first thing he does when he comes into the office in the morning is he pulls up the report. So he can look at activity, but also he looks at rumination mm -hmm. specifically because it's, it's pretty accurately related to, you know, deviations from the baseline are pretty accurately related to um, health of the cow. Is she maybe coming down with mastitis? Um, is our heat abatement working? 
because you know all these things uh, really can can um, reduce uh, rumination and pretty predictably, but you know by substantial amounts by maybe over an hour right per day, and so he, he can very quickly generate a list of animals which have a large deviation, say greater than thirty to fifty minutes or so, and then he can go right to them, and he's found that's one of the most useful tools he has to target his uh, cow attention, his cow time. So I'd say yes, you know, if, if you're really going to use them, I think their, their, their accuracy is, is quite useful on the farm. Now, not for okay. research. I, th th like if you're just trying to get an accurate rumination time for research, we found that there are some issues there. Um, they're not entirely accurate. They're pretty good, but they're not as good as, you know, they, they don't exactly line up with direct observation or, or video. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, the last one, and I, I think I am done. Uh, thanks again. Thanks again. Uh, could you comment a little bit on the use of, of mercury and nitrogen muons? I think you made a comment during your presentation, what you're looking for, what you want to be below one, one digit, or what, what's a good number for you to pay really attention to that. I think it really helps. Yeah, well, I made, I think maybe early on, I was just kind of summarizing our herd, just characterizing our herd. And, and I was making the point, that at least for us, our, you know, we, we track MUNs like anybody would. Um, and when we look for consistency, we look for the number and does it jump around a lot from test to test? Or, you know, actually we have a milk lab here on campus so we can measure MUNs very frequently. Um, but, but certainly we like ours to run in say the, the nine to 10 milligrams per deciliter range, it seems like that's where our herd is most efficient. And I think that would fall in line with a lot of research that's published out there, maybe eight to 10 or 11, um, and it's consistent. So if we see it, it go up, we know that probably we need to take a closer look at uh, the fermentability of our carbohydrate fractions or the solubility, degradability of our protein fractions, right? And we all know how, how that works. The other thing we've noticed since we started monitoring MUNs very frequently here is that it's also highly related to uh, feed availability. So feed bunk management. And I think in the future, when people can have access to more, uh, more MUN measures in, you know, in real time, it becomes part of maybe your parlor system, your milking system. Um, it's going to be a great tool to let you know if, if feed is being pushed back and the cow is not able to consume feed because MUNs just drop dramatically when there's not feed, feed available. Uh, you know, like if we, we milk three times a day and in research, if we pushed feed back between two milkings, the next time the cows are milked, MUNs are very low. You know, it's, it's amazing how much you can move MUNs around by just feed availability. So that would be my short answer for you. Okay, okay. thank you. Congratulations okay. for the presentation. Yeah. Thank oh, you. My pleasure, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Marcos. Um, Paula, <laughs> would you like to resume with your question? Yes, of course, I'm here, I'm <laughs> ready. <laughs> okay, um, I have two questions about grazing systems. Um, one of those is, in Argentina, there are many grazing and dairy systems, which uh, va uh, I cannot read my letter. Uh, which would be the values of rumination, resting, and feeding times? You said these are for for grazing, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that's not. I, I'm, I don't do a lot of grazing work, but I would say the biggest difference from <clears throat> excuse me from a time budgeting standpoint would be the relative differences in resting time and eating time, and, and that's driven a lot, I'd say, by <clears throat> the, the the time that it requires that the cow requires to eat, which is directly related to to the quality and how much is is on offer in the pasture. So I'm guessing it's probably very high quality, I would guess, and probably a lot of it. But still, we, we see resting times reported that are only like, you know, nine hours a, a day. 
uh, for, for grazing animals and they're perfectly fine uh, because of the, of the several hours greater grazing time, right? Um, I think drinking time and other things are, very, are fairly similar and rumination time should be fairly similar too, assuming they're getting adequate uh, fiber intake. Uh, so the big difference is, is the, the much less resting time and much greater time spent grazing or eating. And I'll just say this, it, it makes people wonder why cows in freestall barns seem to need 12 hours a day, roughly, 11 to 12 or 13 hours a day to be healthy. And cows on pasture do well with only nine. <laughs> so uh, it just tells you some of the things a cow has to do to uh, survive in a non-native habitat, I think. <laughs> hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Keep going, Paula. Okay. Um, talking about fiber, which is the main source of effective fiber and the particle length of it in your cows? And which is the theoretical cut length of corn silage you recommend? Okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> In our herd, the main source of, of um, physically effective NDF, effective fiber, would be from the forages for sure. <clears throat> Excuse me, corn silage or hay crop silage. And sometimes, as you saw, we have some dry chopped hay, but not always. All right? Mostly it's corn silage, hay crop silage. And as I said, we, we typically would shoot for about uh, maybe 2 to 5% of the particles on the top screen of the Penn State particle separator. But then we want at least 50% or maybe more than 50% of the as-fed particles to be on that next screen, the eight millimeter screen, because that's the particle size that the cow will chew the TMR particles down to before she eats it, before she swallows it. And we know that particles that are trapped on the eight millimeter or the four millimeter screen, the one right below it, both of those particles uh, require rumination. So they stimulate adequate rumination. They're very physically effective, all right? Th does that make sense? Yes, yes, I okay. think so. That, but then you had a question about theoretical length of cut. And I don't know if I put that one, if I've got that slide handy, um, I, I, there's an easy way to answer that. Yeah, I think yeah, it's Yeah, and if the, you do, Rick, you can, um, is it in the deck you gave me? I think so. Could you pull that up? And I got it here, but I- Yeah. It's also, you to can share, share anything. You know, I can let you share. Well, you, you weren't doing that today. You were being pretty uh, self-centered. <laughs> um, well, I just didn't me, tell you, but I thought you might be good enough at this to know. Well, if I can, if you can give me permission, I'll share this really quickly because yeah, it'll go answer ahead. the question. Um, but I have to stop sharing mine. That's yeah, you the have big, to. Big thing. That's the problem. <laughs> okay. Now, if I can find it here. Uh, I've got so many here. Let's show off. Got too much open. Aha. Is this. Uh, <laughs> God, here it is, slides for AMTS. Let's see if I can find it here. Get this out of the way, slide it up. By the time I get this pulled up, Paul, it'll, it'll be bedtime for you guys. Here we go, can you guys see that okay? Can you see that? Yes. All right, this is the best answer and it's a one size fits all answer. Um, I need to say that I, with, with his permission, I'm using this slide from a fellow named Bill Woodley who is a nutritionist in Ontario, Canada, and has done a lot of work with, with chop length. And what he's got here, it's, it's a great concept. So he's got this scale from less than 10 up to over 22 millimeters, theoretical length of cut, okay? So basically in the English system, you know, basically half an inch to an inch or more, that's what's in play. And so, it makes the point that it, to try to maintain intake and to optimize uh, chewing. If oh. you have, let's take, take, see if you take corn silage, that was your question, I think with corn silage. Yeah, if hold you have on, Rick. Um, oh. 
I don't know if this isn't a problem for you, Paula, if you don't have this, right? I can send it to you. Oh, you don't have it. Oh, okay. Yeah, remember on the Spanish side. I'm wondering if oh, I just geez. take a picture of it real quick and... and yes, I, I think I have it from other slide set, but I, I will try to find it. Yeah, I'm, I'll send you a picture of it if that helps. That might be the quickest thing to do. All right. Yeah. Keep going, right? So if you could, yeah, but I, let me just, my, my quick verbal answer would be the, the, the ideal theoretical length of cut, as you can see, could be as low as uh, 10 or as high as 20 millimeters, right? Depending on whether it's dry, mature corn silage, which needs to be chopped more finely, or if it's a, a wetter corn silage, okay? And so I don't give a just a specific TLC, I would say, tell me more about your crop and its maturity and its moisture content. Okay. And th this is a great slide. This is what I've started using. Even on our own farm, it, it helps us decide where we want to set the chopper. Okay. Thank you. You should give me everything that you might show. Just saying. Anyway. Well, I didn't, I, I didn't foresee <laughs> this. Um, all right, oh, well, take, 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 back, take, take back control now if you're going to be like that. Go ahead. I, I found it now, <laughs> late, but I, I found it. Okay. Let's see. Go ahead, Paula, with more questions, or did he just throw you so much? No, no. Uh, I have more. Uh, in, in your experience, when using mattresses, is there a difference between using bedding materials on top of it? Mattresses, is there differences among bedding materials? Um, well, surely there would be. I have to admit, all we've really ever, all I've ever used would either be um, sawdust or chopped straw or something very similar to that. Um, I've known a few farms that have put sand on top of mattresses, but that is a real hard thing to manage, right? Um, but they made it work. It was a tie stall barn actually, and it worked well, but it was a lot of physical work to keep those clean and to get the sand laid manure out of the barn and off the mattress. Um, I think the key thing, um, and I talked a little bit about it, it was garbled, so maybe you couldn't understand it that well. But I think if, you're, if you've got mattresses and you can, Try to get closer to, the closer you can get to 10 centimeters, the better. And I, we have a hard time doing that here. We're lucky if we can get half of that uh, depth, you know, to try to protect the hawks and, and, and guard against lameness issues. Uh, but I think that's the key thing. The one thing I don't like to see are people who put in mattresses or water beds or something like that and think that they need just a very minimal amount of a bedding, that, that rarely works. That's where you see really poor hocks, a lot of swollen hocks and, and lameness issues, particularly with water beds. I think people think water beds don't need it, uh, but they do. <clears throat> okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. May I go on, Marian? Um, yes, keep going, Paula, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I have a few questions related to fat to protein ratio. Uh, do you use this relationship as an alarm to monitor feed sorting? Uh, which Excuse is the, yes. I, I just coughed. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and do you? Which is a, a reasonable range you you like to see? Yeah, well, honestly, we don't, we don't monitor that a whole lot. Um, well, we've started monitoring more and it's, it's, it's fairly useful. Um, like normally we would see, let me just do the math here quickly. When, when things are working well in our herd, we might see something like uh, four to 4.2% fat and maybe three to 3.2% protein. So, you know, that works out too. Let me just do the math here. Um, you know, 1.3 or so. So that, that's, if, you were, if we were monitoring 
the fat to protein, that's about where we'd want to be. Okay. And then you could, and if our, in our herd, I think a herd that averages because of genetics and feeding about 4%, I would say milk fat depression is really beginning when you get down to about three, seven or three, eight. Um, there's no reason for it to be that low. So you can do the math there. What we have found to be much better, and I know it may not be available, but with Heather Dan and Dave Barbano doing that work with de novo mixed and preformed fatty acids, that has been so much more useful for us to monitor feed bunk management as well as you know what you have in, in the diet. So if the cows are sorting, and maybe becoming acidotic, if feed is pushed back and unavailable, all of those things, we can see uh, changes in, in de novo, mixed or preformed, okay? Or the level of unsaturated, the level of unsaturation of the fatty acids. Now, if you can't measure that, understand that, that that's, <laughs> doesn't matter, but that's a much, for us, a much more accurate uh, set of metrics. Okay, yes, the, the following question was about uh, if you had a relationship 1.3 to 1, the, the number you gave us, uh, you just gave us, do you consider the protein should be higher? Is it a goal or a metabolic result? Should I, are you saying should the protein be higher? Or Yes. Yeah, well, it, it depends on what the actual number of, of the protein is. Like you have to know your herd. So you have to know the genetics, I think, in your herd. And so with our herd, I think um, we should easily, we, we should be able to be at 3.2%. And so if you look at the fat to protein ratio and it's not where you want it, and part of it's being driven by protein being three or 3.1, then yes, then we need to look at, look at uh, formulation to improve the protein. But honestly, in, in our situation, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, as the fat to protein ratio varies, it's the fat that's varying, okay? Our protein doesn't vary much, but our, our, pro our fat may be 4.2, it may be four. Sometimes, especially you know, during heat stress, it might drop down for some cows to, to 3.5 or lower. And so it's, it, I think the variation is due to fat more than protein. Um, and, and a lot of the fat variation for us is explained by changes or variation in de novo fatty acids, right? The ones that are synthesized in the mammary gland. Okay. okay. And, and the last one was related to the de novo fatty acid synthesis. Uh -huh. uh, is, it, is it a consequence of rumen acidosis, the, the decrease in the novel fatty acid synthesis? Well, it, it can be related to that for sure, yes. Um, I mean, basically, the, the, the simple-minded way that I think about it is, you know, so de novo fatty acids are synthesized from acetate and butyrate. So um, those would come from primarily rumen fiber digestion, fermentation. And so if you think about rumen conditions that would uh, reduce microbial fermentation, the activity of that, or the efficiency of the microbial fermentation, uh, rumen pH has got to be one of the top factors in your list, right? Um, so that, that would be one thing I would definitely keep in mind. Um, particle size of the diet can have an impact through rumen pH, but also maybe uh, you have finely ground forages and you have fast turnover, right? That could speed some of the, um, the, the passage of some of the CLA that uh, depress milk fat synthesis. You see what I'm saying? Um, so pH is an important one. It's not the only one. Yes, right. Okay, Paula, you. you have one more? Yes, I, I think we are checking it, but I, I have okay. at least one more. Okay. So uh, it, this is about uh, feeding management. Uh, does once a day feeding affect the feeding efficiency by increasing the waste feed? The oh, waste so can, feed? If, if I'm understanding the, the question properly, so if we only feed 
once a day, do you increase feed wastage? Is that, that that's yes. the question? Yeah. Yes. Well, you can't, you, you, you increase your risk for doing that for sure. Um, two ways, at least. One is it's just, it can, depending on the density of the ration, that, that can be a lot to deliver at one time. And depending on the design of the feed bunk, some of that TMR can end up in the, in the feed alley, or excuse me, in the alley where the cow's standing. So it's wasted, just physically wasted. But more importantly, and this is probably what you're getting at with the question, is with that much feed sitting in the bunk for 24 hours, it has a much greater chance of going out of condition, right? Heating, refermenting, that sort of thing. So I think if you're feeding once a day, like I said, we are right now, you have to make sure that the weather allows it. And it's, it's cool here now. If you have heat stress, that would be a hard thing to do. But also you need to make sure the diet's not a sortable diet, right? So the particle length and the difference in, in density between the feed ingredients really doesn't create a situation where the diet falls apart easily. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So once, once, once a day is easy, but it, but it has to be done right. Otherwise it can be a disaster. Yeah, from, yes. from a feed uh, wastage. Many Many of our systems are outside without a roof, so uh, it's it's difficult to keep the the fresh feed inside the feed bank. Yeah, so then I think once a day would be hard under those conditions. Yes. Yeah. I think so. Okay, may I? I yes. Ask? Keep going. Paul. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Rick. Um, the the cows you showed us the, with the 750 kilos more or less. Uh, how how much feed do you um, offer to those cows, and w which is the refusal you look for? Yeah, well, so the, the 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 feed that we offer would just be based on the number of animals in the pen, of course, and right, and their uh, their prediction or their measured. We we measure their dry matter intake. So we can adjust that and stay ahead of it. Um, in terms of, I think that the key part of that is what kind of refusals do we shoot for? And let, let me say, we probably feed for higher refusals than some commercial herds would for research purposes. But even without that, I would say for uh, like our close up and our fresh cows, our transition cows, we would almost always have uh, feed refusals after 24 hours of at least 5%. And I think I would make that a statement even for a commercial dairy farm. You would not want to ever shortchange uh, feed availability and therefore dry matter intake for your fresh cows or close-up cows. Because with fresh cows, of course, you know, feed intake and meal patterns are so highly related to metabolic disorders. Our early lactation pens typically unless they're on trial, if they're on research, we, we overfeed. But if they're just regular cows in our pens, we would probably shoot for somewhere between uh, three to 5% refusals. And I think uh, for commercial dairy, I might extend that to two to 5%, 2% if the feeders are excellent, man, ex excellent at what they do. Because 2% is not very much. And it's easy to have the bunks become functionally empty from the cow's perspective, right? And then later lactation, if you really want to try to save, uh, you know, feed refusals, that's where you can probably drop it down to, you know, one or two to 3%, okay? You're, you're getting ready to dry these cows off. It's not as important for them. So does that, does that make sense? Yes, yes, of course. Yep. Uh, and, uh, talking about the weight of the cows, uh, do, do you recommend uh, a frequency? Uh, do you have a recommended frequency to weigh the cows? Do, do you think it's uh, useful to have uh, those weights uh, frequently? Uh, well, kind of going back to the first question, right? Um, certainly more, more frequent body weight measures are useful if you can do it. Um, it. It can also be expensive. And if you have a system that's predicting body weights, it needs to be accurate because I think an inaccurate body weight might be worth 
less than nothing, right? Um, but uh, uh, to me, like I said, my first answer, the, the, the key parts would be to get an accurate body weight, you know, right at calving, one that kind of represents the animal after she's, you know, peaked out and is beginning to, to regain condition. So at least one or two during lactation, maybe just after peak and then mid lactation or so. And then sometime a dry off would be useful, right? If she, especially if she's going to be put in a chute or brought across the scale, she could be run across the scale for another reason as well. Um, but if the farmer is thinking about putting in a system, of course, if you can get more accurate body weights, you're going to have a better uh, predictions of dry matter intake, which is the most important thing for ration formulation. Um, Rick, and uh, sorry to interrupt, Paula. No, go is, ahead. What is your said suggestion on making diets unsortable? What is the best way to do that? Uh -huh. Well, I think the key thing is, it's at several factors, but the key thing is particle size. Okay, and you saw, Marianne, our, di our diets are, are pretty finely chopped, yeah. relatively speaking. A lot of people would look at that and go, God, you must have horrible components, but we don't. It's, the key thing is to make sure the particles are chopped in a way that they, you have some longer particles, but no, none over one to two inches, and you have a lot of particles that are trapped on that eight millimeter screen. So particle size of the forage particles especially, that's the key thing. Also dryness, right? If you have a very dry TMR, uh, we know that those are gonna sort easier than, a, than one that has more moisture. And you can either add water or you can add molasses or some combination, people do that. Um, and then the other thing I would say is just the relative density of the ingredients. Because if you have a, a feed, typically like a grain or something that's, that's, much, that's very dense, it's naturally going to sort itself out as the cow kind of does her sorting maneuver where she throws the feet up on that little uh, incline that she's created in the hole. You know, she, she creates a hole like a cone and then she starts flipping feet and watches it run back down. It's just like she studied physical engineering. And, and so if you have very dense particles, they're going to sort out very quickly, All right? But particle size, moisture, changes in specific density or density would be my, the three big factors, All right? And so consistency in all of those and try not to have very, you know, really dry rations. Right. Yeah. Paula? Go ahead. Yes, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is a, a, a question uh, from Adrian. Uh, could you find a relationship between resting time and feed efficiency? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of some specific data sets, but in general, yeah, so if you have greater resting time or, or your, the resting time is met, I'm trying to think if there's data which specifically relates that to, you know, greater milk production per unit of dry matter consumed. Um, I might have a hard time finding data. My gut would tell me, yes, for sure you might expect that. Um, you'd have a healthier animal. She should have more natural eating patterns. Digestive efficiency should be better. I'd have to see if I can find uh, data sets which actually uh, show what I think is true. <laughs> That's bad. I'm a bad scientist. But um, does that make sense? But I'll, I'll see if I can find something. Yeah, yeah because okay. you, you would expect that for sure. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Rick. This was a very interesting presentation. Yes. All of your presentations, always. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. We always, and the, the evenings are, there's always so many good questions from the, the people in Argentina. And I always end up feeling sorry for Paula at the end because she oh. just has to be, <clears throat> she's doing all the, you know, Paula and Paula. They, they just have a lot to do on these webinars, so. Um. Okay, well, I apologize for speaking fast, and I will say, if there's anything I mentioned that Marianne doesn't have, just let her know. I'll get it to her, and then she can make it available to everybody in terms of slides or something like that. Yeah. So, okay. Okay.
All right. Great. Thank yeah, you. you'll send that extra slide, Rick, that you withheld. That was the, which one was that, the TLC one? Uh, I think so. Let me check my, my picture. Um, ideal range. Yeah, from Bill Woodley. I'll send that to you today before I leave my office. You ought to so go I don't home forget. sometime. Okay. I, I, have, I have that, but uh, what I need is the, the Word file, if you can. Yes. Now, oh, well, okay. I think I sent, that, I sent that to you in your email, Paula. Ah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, if you are interested in, in having some discussions next week about climate change and trying to in, improve um, or decrease emissions, do check in at nine o'clock tomorrow or next, next week. Um, go to our website for a login page and Rick, thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, yeah. All right. Thank you everybody for joining us and we'll see you if not next week's next month. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.